pest management, where we'll be looking at pests such as sclerotinia, flea beetles, clubroot, and verticillium. At the end of this session, we'll have another Q&A as well, so please save your questions for our presenters for the panel then. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Susie Lee. Susie is a senior researcher at InnoTech Alberta, Inc. She received her PhD from the University of Alberta in 2000. She's been working in the agriculture-related field for more than 20 years. Her research focus is crop disease prediction, and Susie's presentation is titled Development and Field Deployment of a Biosensor for Sclerotinia Stem Rot Forecasting. So welcome to the stage, Susie. I'm pleasantly surprised uh, by this morning's speaker because I have to maybe I'll use both. Thank you. So I'm pleasantly surprised by the speakers this morning and they were average height that is below below the, the general standard, I would say. And I'm proud to say that I'm the shortest among them all. So um, before I run out of time, uh, I would like to, oh, I would like to see the most important things of the presentation. And we appreciate the funding support from uh, the cluster, including Canola, Canola Council of Canada, Alberta Canola, South Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers Association, and the Government of Canada and their Canadian Agriculture Partnership Agri-Science Program. And Scortinia stem rot uh, is an e economically important disease, and it's difficult to uh, predict. So on Wednesday's uh, Q&A session, I remember Bonnie mentioned that when the uh, producers or farmers uh, come to her for uh, guidance on should and should not, when and where to spray fungicides, and her answer is always, uh, you know, you go spray. Uh, I don't blame her on that because she doesn't have a decisive answer for those questions. Um, so the goal of our project is to uh, answer those questions. So if you have a biosensor in the field, it will tell you if you have Scortinia stem rot in your field by specifically identifying the pathogen uh, disease spores with uh, the assist of antibodies. And uh, if you install a biosensor unit in the field, uh, you will be able to tell where to spray, and the biosensor will also tell you that um, the spore level in correlation with uh, the disease severity in a real-time fashion, so you can just uh, uh, know when to spray. And on the right-hand side, uh, the picture shows a biosensor we deployed in the past summer, uh, I should say that during the process, we received lots of help from different people. For example, like uh, I was holding a black box with my prototype biosensor in the uh, Killam crop walk, and uh, uh, Mr. Keith Gabbard came to me and said, Susie, I think you should use a white one instead of a black one. So he's a genius because the black box will uh, absorb so much heat that will heat up your sensor unit and the sensitive parts of uh, the detection will be damaged. So in the uh, sensor, we have a spore trap and we have a detection compartment and we also have a data transmission part. So for the spore trap, we tested several commercial traps and in the end, we designed our own a liquid-based trap. And this is subject to a patent pending technology, even though I would love to uh, explain it to you in more details, but I can't. So bear with me. And also because of this, I couldn't bring a unit here to demo um, my apology. And uh, however, uh, we 
received a patent from the U.S. Patent Office about this technology and besides this spore trap and the detection technique. So lots of people ask me about the specificity of the antibodies we produced. Um, actually, uh, we did some experiment to show you how specific is the antibodies. And in this picture, you can see that the little brownish black uh, dots are two micron beads that coated with antibodies. And in the middle, there is uh, Scortinia, Scolorchiorum, uh, Ascospores. You can see that uh, the bees are capturing the spores because they are coated with antibodies. And more spores uh, were captured. And in this picture, we have the uh, Botrytis scenario spores here that causes uh, gray mold in uh, canola as well. And uh, you see the antibodies are not, not interested in those spores. And even you put more spores there, it's still not, they are still not interested. And we also uh, mixed uh, some spores from black-like diseases, uh, like uh, the Leptospheria uh, maculans uh, spores. And these are antibody-coated bees, and they have no interaction at all. And we also mixed uh, uh, the Scortinia spores and the Physerum graminaria spores together, and we put it in a pool of antibody-coated bees, and you can see the specificity of our antibodies. Um, so for the spore detection, and uh, the three finger-like structures are the electrodes. So when the spores passing through these electrodes, so you will see a single score measurement uh, by the uh, by the impedance by this uh, in, by this instrument, I should say. And uh, this is picture shows you a single ascor spores detected, and more spores can be detected use this technology as well. So uh, in the conclusion, so uh, for this biosensor development, so we have spore trap that traps spore in a 24 hours interval, and we detect them once a day. And after, right after detection, uh, the data will be transmitted to my cell phone, and in the future, I hope it's your cell phone. So we uh, have a group of uh, students from University of Alberta who did the uh, proof of concept stage, and when it comes to the real field application, it's proved to be difficult for them to do. So we uh, recruit a group of engineers from Inotech, and uh, they made a breakthrough uh, later 2021 and early 2022. So we were able to put all these components together and to make this unit. And what even better is that uh, the automation uh, is also included. And you see the antenna on top that is used for transmit uh, uh, the data from, from the box. And if I give you the box and then you bring it to the field, in, you install it and you go back home and check your email, you find nothing. Because I didn't tell you to turn it on before you leave. <laughs> so we managed to uh, assemble uh, 12 uh, biosensor units and we deploy six of them um, in four locations, like two in Lacombe and two in Vegreville and one in Lavoy and one in Viking. And this is a screenshot of the emails I received. So after installation, I went back to my comfort of my office and I have never been so excited waiting for an email to show up on my cell phone. And this is from one of the unit and we also installed a me memory stick in the box just in case if the wireless uh, network break down, we can still collect the data from, from the uh, sensor. But unfortunately, there is no perfect world. So for the, all the six units we deployed, and two of them sent four days of data, and one sent two days of data, and one sent zero. Only one perfect unit sent us information uh, for the whole duration of, uh, of uh, a month and a half. So we brought them back and, and we did some troubleshooting and we found that 
One is because the low quality of some of the parts we bought to try to save money. And, and the other is uh, off-the-shelf modular. Actually, this is the main problem we had because this one is used to control the on and off of, of the detection uh, compartment, but it failed miserably. So we have the whole set of data from one of the sensor unit. So for the uh, first few days, we did have a uh, commercial uh, sport trap, and, and we collected data as well, and we compared to each other, and they were uh, matched up well. And on July the 12th, we spray some sports. So unfortunately, we lost a couple of days of data, but the, uh, after that, we see uh, the sport number actually doubled after the spray. And also, like, um, during uh, this whole collection period, if you see rain in the field, then uh, you can see you collect uh, lower numbers of spores. And we also did some, uh, uh, we throw some uh, uh, scorcher bodies to the plots, just uh, want to increase the spore load in the field. And uh, it takes them three to four weeks to germinate. And then we see the trend that at the end of, of uh, our um, spore collection, we see the increase of spores. I don't see this result is significant because statistically, if you only have one set of data, you can't see that it's good. That's why we are trying to do more um, in the future uh, to make it uh, statistically valid. So we have one uh, biosensor unit that it per, uh, performed uh, uh, very well, and the other failed uh, miserably. <laughs> and that's something that make me lost sleep in the night. And then I figured out if in the middle of the night you woke up and everything is so quiet and you thought about the problem and solutions, and your thought process is really effective. Probably you can come up with some good ideas. So usually in the next morning, I, I talk to my technologists and say, you can try this and try that. I thought about this last night. They were like, are they from your dreams? But some of them actually uh, really worked. So uh, I suggest that if you are desperate, so please try this approach. And also I lost sleep because we, we overuse the, the money, so we are over budget. Um, because we use higher than highly qualified personnel. So the, the, of course it costs more money, money than you expected, right? And it was like, it would be a shame if I sp stopped working on this. It's like you run a 100 meter race and you stop at 95.8 meters. So that's, you know, you don't feel good. So we reached out to Canola Council of Canada, and fortunately, um, Mr. Uh, Chris Muncher and helped prepare a, a supporting letter because we are a really hu huge organizations as uh, Inaltech. We have different departments like heavy oil and, and that stuff. So I think it's more important than us agriculture, and so we have to persuade them. So the the supporting letter really helped. And, and I think that people say that uh, one, a picture was a thousand words, so the supporting light uh, was multi-thousand dollars for us. So we use that money, we secure some funding from Inotech so we can uh, continue work on this. Uh, now we are working on sourcing uh, better quality uh, parts and we try to design our own uh, modulars uh, that it won't fail for us in the future. Also, we found some flaws uh, in the assembly because uh, some of the uh, tubings and uh, whatever in there is not user friendly. So we are working on to improve those as well. And also in the future, we are continue doing troubleshootings and, and we do some work uh, this winter in the greenhouse and green, uh, girls chamber and hopefully we can have uh, all the good units put out next year. So in the process, actually, we trained uh, some of uh, the graduate students, and they also contribute to the, to the work. And I should say that our group of engineers and scientists in Unitech did the heavy lifting for the project as well. So with that, um, thank you for your attention. 
and uh, uh, I, I look forward to the Q, to your questions in the Q and A session, and hopefully they are not hard ones. Thank you, Susie, for that presentation. Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Dwayne Hegedus. Dwayne was raised on a prairie farm in Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, perhaps tired of his father's complaints about low grain prices and picking stones. He decided to enroll in the University of Sask Saskatchewan in 1984, but continued to farm with his brother and his father for many years after. He obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology and Immunology and a Master's and a PhD degree in Applied Microbiology while studying the biological control fungi that kill insects. Duane joined Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon in 1997 as an insect biotechnologist. His research involves the application of genomics to study insect and pathogen host plant interactions. So welcome, Duane. Uh, well, well, thank you for that, that bio. Uh, I used to farm and I didn't get any sleep then and now I moved into research for 35 years and I still don't get any sleep. So Susie, I can certainly appreciate what you're going through. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, something that's been going on for a number of years and that's our efforts to increase um, flea beetle tolerance in canola. and. Uh, the CAP project itself is about the genetic resources that are available for flea beetle resistance. But I'm going to tell you more of a story about what's happening with hairy canola, and so that's going to require a little bit of the past and some of the present and maybe a, um, a look into the future as well. So uh, it's a pretty broad audience, uh, although uh, in Probably a few of you would know that uh, flea beetles are by far, I think without argument, the most devastating uh, pest of canola um, that we uh, are currently dealing with. There are two different species of uh, flea beetle that are um, of a problem. Uh, one is the crucifer flea beetle, which appears pretty well throughout the growing season, and the second being the striped flea beetle, which we're seeing an increasing abundance in the spring. Uh, we don't see as much of it in the fall. Uh, what you see on the right or the left is a canola plant uh, that has been not treated uh, in the field, although we saw treated plants, you know, this year that were, you know, suffering uh, the same fate. And uh, as a consequence, um, all of the, or virtually all of the canola seed that's grown in Western Canada is treated with a variety of insecticides, uh, most of it with a group 4A uh, neonic uh, insecticide, but we might also see some additional treatments, uh, usually aimed at additional flea beetle and cutworm control, and they could constitute a group 4C, 4D, or a group 28 insecticide that are also added to the seed treat, or as part of the seed treatment. Now, this has actually served the industry very, very well over the years, and um, I think we'll continue to do so in some capacity uh, going forward. But there are always going to be challenges with insecticides with respect to off-target effects. Um, we've seen uh, lots of uh, literature about the impacts that neonicotinoids can have on bees and birds. And of course, there are sustainability issues as insects develop resistance to insecticides and we have to move to different uh, chemistries. So, um, Recognizing this a number of years ago, two of my colleagues, now retired, uh, Dr. Marty Gruber and uh, Julie Soroka, uh, took it upon themselves to sort of take a different, uh, maybe a more natural approach to, uh, to flea beetle control. And they looked at what was happening in some of the, uh, the, the wild brassica species. And uh, one thing that uh, plants use to uh, shield themselves from insects uh, is by growing hairs, okay? I don't have as much as I used to. Um, but uh, plants can uh, really very effectively um, shield themselves from, uh, from insect damage uh, by um, producing these hairs, or sometimes called trichomes, uh, on their surface. And here I have a little video, if I can sort out how to activate it. Uh, how do I activate a video here? I need a pointer. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, here we go. So uh, on the right, we have a flea beetle that is, uh, you know, uh, settled down on a, uh, I guess, a contemporary canola, and you can see it is very, um, you know, easily eating away at the um, 
at the canola and on the left you saw a flea beetle uh, you know transit across a hairy canola leaf with abundant trichomes and it uh, wasn't able to settle it wasn't able to sit down to begin feeding and it very quickly moved off the leaf so we see this often with the uh, uh, the brassica napis and the canola varieties or the canola types that uh, that have these leaves and and the reason for this and uh, this was documented by uh, Julie Sirocco one of my colleagues is that uh, flea beetles have to go through this program series of steps. It's about seven different steps, settling, tapping, uh, tasting, before they can actually begin feeding. And if you disrupt them at any point within this program series, they have to reset to the first step. And so it's almost like a dog having to turn around three times, and we had one like that before it settles down. And if you tapped it after it turned around once or twice, it would look at you and, and be kind of you know, disturbed. And then it would start the whole process again and have to turn around three times. And so, I mean, you could really have a lot of amusement in the afternoon if you tease the dog. But, uh, you know, flea beetles are actually, uh, you know, incurring the same thing. So, uh, again, you know, Margie and Julie, uh, you know, set out to, um, uh, to address this. And they developed what is called hairy canola. And how did they do this? Well, it was actually rather ingenious. And so they took uh, uh, the contemporary uh, canola at the time, which is uh, Westar, and they did two things to it. First of all, they replaced a gene called GL3. And so they took that from a, a relative of canola, which is Arabidopsis thaliana, which produces these uh, branch trichomes. And they took that from Arabidopsis and they introduced it into Westar. And as a second order of business, they also reduced the expression of another gene called TTG1. And as a consequence, they were able to develop a canola type that uh, had a lot of uh, trichomes and that also uh, looked and uh, grew um, as you would expect a normal canola too. And the two genes that they, that they selected are important because they're at the base of a, a number of different pathways here at the core that regulate a, a number of different developmental uh, uh, phenotypes within a plant, one of which is trichomes. Uh, we also, they also regulate root hair development. They also regulate the formation of certain secondary metabolites like anthocyanins, as well as they regulate uh, seed coat mucilage. So they're very, very important master regulators. If we uh, look at how the, uh, the hairy canola behaved in a field situation, uh, if we just focus on the, uh, on, the, on the pink bars here, which is the hairy canola, and if we look at the percent flea beetle damage uh, in response to, uh, in a field situation in both untreated and compare that to uh, canola varieties that have been treated with a, uh, an insecticide, we can see that at the early uh, stage leaves, uh, the hairy canola holds up really well, uh, very comparable to the, uh, the, um, uh, the treated canola seed. And at the later stage leaves, when maybe the insecticide is beginning to, to wane and not having as much of an effect, um, uh, it actually performs uh, even better. So why is this not in farmers' fields? And I've been asked this question so many times. Well, there's a, a number of different reasons for this, and I think it's important to uh, understand how the industry works. First of all, it required two GMO events. Uh, one was to uh, induce hair production via the uh, GL3. And the second one was to fix the developmental defects um, caused by the overexpression of GL3. So there were two GMO events required. Secondly, there was a patent on the, uh, the GL3 gene owned by the University of Texas. And uh, secondly, uh, interest from breeding companies. Um, of course, the registration and the regular costs for GMO traits is very high. And you have to appreciate that there were internal conflicts within the business units because most of our major breeding companies are also chemical companies. And we were told that it was difficult for the breeders to take this case to the board of directors if you're going to be developing a uh, canola variety that requires uh, less insecticide. Well, that's going to impact that division. And, and, and I get that. I mean, they're, they're businesses. They're not um, set up any differently than, uh, I guess, we run our households. So uh, undeterred by that, um, we started to look for more natural sources of, of, of hairiness. And so we screened about a thousand different brassica lines for hairiness. This included Argentine canola, Polish canola, uh, the vegetable brassicas, the old Aracea, uh, a line of brassica velosa, as well as brassica nigra, which is the progenitor of the mustards. And we ended up with finding a, a few, not many, but a few uh, hairy brassicas. 
Uh, the Brassica napis and the Brassica rafa produce these erect cactus-like trichomes or hairs. Uh, the one line of Brassica velosus that, that we had, had was replete, just absolutely abundant uh, with hairs, and they produce these really soft hairs that lay down flat against the surface of the plant. Uh, they're almost like a, feel like a velvet uh, uh, surface. Uh, so uh, then began sort of the next stage in the odyssey to access the, the naturally hairy trait. Uh, Margie and Julie uh, retired, unfortunately. And uh, then I teamed up with uh, two other researchers, Isabel Parkin and uh, Sally Vale. Uh, we received some cap funding about five years ago uh, to pursue this. Uh, now, none of the people in, in, in black here actually, uh, sorry. So none of the people in, in black here, myself and Isabel and, and, and Sally, are, are really actually very important. Uh, the important person here was a research associate who's been with me for a long time, six or seven years, working on hairy canola, uh, Dr. Um, Zora Hedarian, who really led all of the work to identify the, the genes and, the, uh, and the, the loci underlying the, uh, the hairy trait. And more recently, a student that came to us from the University of Regina who um, an incredibly intelligent, uh, hard worker, and uh, who literally saved our behinds this summer uh, when everybody in the lab was sick with COVID, and she saved uh, a big part of the project. And uh, so I guess I'm very appreciative of both of them, and uh, it was really a wonder to see how well they worked together. So uh, we looked at two sources of uh, hairiness. We looked, uh, tried to map the uh, Nebraska the napis uh, uh, hairiness trait. These are the, uh, the cactus-like trichomes as well as the, uh, the hairy phenotype from Brassica velosa, which are the, uh, the velvet-like trichomes. And uh, this was a, we started out with a very, uh, you know, uh, typical mapping exercise where we crossed a, a hairy Brassica napis with a glabrous Brassica napis. It has a few trichomes, so it's able to produce hairs, but not very many of them. The F1 generation, uh, the progeny from that cross had, oh, I keep pushing the wrong button here. Big fingers, unfortunately, big fingers. So the progeny from that cross had about 150 trichomes, which indicates uh, that it's probably controlled by more than one gene, so it's a quantitative trait, which is kind of what we expected. Uh, when we looked at the genetics, uh, things got really interesting, and so we developed a, uh, a genetically fixed mapping population from that, uh, from that F1. And I just want to point out here that the, the phenotyping of that population was, uh, took a lot of effort. We looked at 300 lines, we looked at the first and third leaf, we counted the hairs on the top, the bottom, the perimeter, the petiole. We did five replicates for lines. So in total, that one population required 12,000 measurements, so a phenomenal amount of work. What we found, though, within that, and because the data was so good, was that within that population, uh, we saw a, a sort of a continuous trait as we expected, but within the population, we found lines that had far more hairs than even the hairy parent. So the hairy parent had about 350 trichomes per leaf. Within that population are fixed, uh, genetically fixed lines that have upwards of 800 uh, hairs per leaf. We see an effect on flea beetle feeding at 350 per leaf. 800 per leaf should be substantial. So we're really excited about this material. We then coupled the, uh, the phenotyping data with, the, uh, with, the, with genotyping data, uh, assignment of um, genetic markers, and we identified a very, very strong QTL, uh, representing about 18% of, uh, of the variation on chromosome 11, and it was responsible for uh, both hairs on the top and the bottom of the leaf on the perimeter as well as on the PDO. So we're quite excited about having mapped, you know, one of the major QTLs for, uh, for trigon formation in Brassica napis. We then moved on to the mapping of the trait in Brassica velosa. Uh, again, we crossed a Brassica velosa. And I just want to point out, uh, previously I was talking about hairs per leaf. Brassica velosa has 3,000 hairs per square centimeter. That's about the end of your pinky. So it's incredibly densely uh, populated with, uh, with hairs. We crossed that with a, uh, a non-hairy uh, C. genome species of Loraceae. Again, we, we looked at the progeny of that. It had about uh, something intermediate, about 300 hairs per square centimeter, indicating that it's, again, a quantitative trait. These C. genome species, though, are very, not very amenable to uh, tissue culture, uh, the method used to make these double haploid populations, and so we had to resort to a more traditional recombinant inbred population. 
That, however, takes a lot of time and it means, uh, you know, selfing seed from each one of the generations until you eventually build up a large genetically fixed population. Uh, that took us four and a half years to do. So uh, a long time, an awful lot of work. We finished that this summer. We have about 800 of these uh, recombinant inbred lines. The exciting thing though is within this genetically fixed recombinant inbred population are lines with an extremely large amount of trichomes. So we have lines with about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 per leaf, but we also have fixed lines now that are extremely hairy, that are as hairy or even hairier than the hairy velosa print, uh, parent. And more importantly, the Brasca velosa, we struggled with it because it's self-incompatible. It doesn't form seed with itself very easily. But we have lines within the population now that are self-compatible, meaning that you can generate seed from that line as well, and that's far more attractive in a breeding program. So we've actually been able to separate self-incompatibility from, uh, from trichome formation. So the next steps then are, um, we uh, are using the, uh, uh, this nested association mapping population that we've heard so much about the last couple of days that were developed by Isabel and Sally and, um, and Steve Robinson, uh, and a tremendous resource that is saving years. Uh, we've found three uh, other lines uh, within that population that have trichomes, and um, of course all of the genotyping is complete, and we're um, set now to begin phenotyping that to identify additional genes responsible for trichomformation of Brasca napis. With respect to the uh, Brasca velosa trait, um, we phenotyped about 300 lines over the last couple of months. Um, the genotyping is about to begin uh, as soon as possible. And I guess more importantly, we uh, have begun crossing the Brasca velosa, Brasca lapis, uh, real six line, one of the C genome lines, with Brasca rapa, which is an A genome species, to resynthesize Brasca napis. And we're really quite keen on this because the Brasca napis produces the trichome like, or the, uh, the cactus like trichomes, the velosa, the velvet like trichomes, and far more of them. And we're really interested to see what those crosses are going to, uh, to generate. And finally, there's a linkage now we know between drought tolerance and trichome formation. It provides a sort of a physical shield uh, for, the, um, uh, for the plant. And as well, in some soon to be published uh, information, there's also a genetic linkage between trichomes and sclerotinia resistance. And so we're gonna be looking at our population and uh, uh, trying to draw those correlations as well. So uh, in summary, um, uh, what we've hoped to do, or what we have done, is to uh, capture most or all of the QTLR genes controlling hair production in, in Brassica species. At the end of this exercise, we're going to have an extremely good understanding of the complexity of the hairiness trait. We'll have DNA markers or have DNA markers for the QTL regions. We already have fixed stable lines with high levels of hair that would be you know, very suitable, very attractive for breeding programs. And there's also the potential for linkage to other traits such as drought tolerance and stem rot resistance. So um, if you don't remember anything from this talk, I'm hoping you'll maybe take away this image, okay? And uh, we already have a holiday tree to my right, okay? Maybe we can have an online vote as to whose holiday tree is uh, a little more attractive. Given the community, I'm, I'm hoping you'll vote for the hairy canola, so. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I personally would vote for the Harry Canola Christmas tree, but I'd now like to introduce Dr. Gary Peng to the stage. Gary received his PhD in plant pathology at the University of Guelph in 1992. He is currently a research scientist with AAFC out of Saskatoon, working primarily on black leg and club root diseases of canola, including plant pathogen interaction, host resistance, pathogen race monitoring, and disease management strategies. He has led a large number of research projects on these diseases over the past 15 years and received several research or achievement awards. He's also authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers. So welcome to the stage, Gary. Yeah, okay, I try to uh, make sure I don't press the wrong button. Um, 
thank you. Uh, and uh, I would cut right to the chest uh, with the uh, with the information. Uh, um, I think it's a pretty uh, safe to say that uh, uh, genetic resistance is the key for color control on canola. Uh, when several of us are discussing or discussing this project, uh, we were faced with a fairly interesting situation that uh, uh, more pathotypes are coming up or identified, and the uh, uh, first generation resistance is being broken down in the many the fields. So uh, uh, that's where uh, this uh, project is uh, uh, is uh, getting started with. And apparently you can see uh, from the uh, the list here, uh, we have uh, some quite uh, established lab and experienced researchers uh, joining the, the team and covering from the pathology, the genetics, all the way to the breeding uh, of, uh, of uh, the resistance. Worked. Yeah, the uh, the objectives are quite straightforward. We uh, we have uh, a project in the South Saskatoon looked at a large number of uh, the germplasm uh, pool and uh, um, had some good uh, uh, resistant sources. And the more will be um, explored in this project, and more against those newly identified uh, um, pathotypes. And also, we wanted to uh, uh, develop the the uh, the, the uh, uh, markers uh, to be able to to, uh, um, to to be used by by the industry for the resistance incorporation, and, and possibly the the uh, understanding of the mechanism of the resistance behind some of those genes, and of course, the mapping work is uh, is uh, the base of that. And you know, we we wanted to leave no stones unturned and to make sure we have a thorough search and eventually we'll have a new resistant materials for our industry and possibly a new uh, uh, management of strategies. In terms of uh, research approaches, uh, uh, there are some common the methods that we're using like uh, it was screening for the resistance, but at the same time for the mapping, Almost each lab uses quite uh, uh, up-to-date technologies like uh, uh, GYs and uh, uh, genotyping by sequencing um, by Feng Cheng at the uh, AFC Saskatoon. So the resistance uh, characterization and uh, and then we use the uh, the omics uh, um, technologies to analyze the resistance mechanisms and we further look at the uh, system. To uh, to assess the resistance durability, um, so this is a bit of a kind of an overall approach of what you we we have used, um, and not in a lot of details. The uh, in the following slides, I will just give a highlight of uh, you know, what has happened in the different labs, and this is uh, in uh, Steve Strakov's lab. But uh, I uh, I want to get my pointer here. Uh, I just wanted to point to uh, Rudolph uh, is a rising star in doing this uh, resistance work, so I remember his name. They uh, screened a large number of uh, um, candidates and, uh, um, and over a thousand of those and, and uh, found the resistance sources uh, against the, uh, the different uh, new pathotypes here. Uh, with all the uh, uh, different materials, so the Napis, uh, uh, Rapa, uh, Nigra, and this is just an example of the comparison of uh, Napis. Um, most of those are, uh, are probably the uh, Rutabaga uh, species, uh, uh, varieties. Uh, those uh, darker colors uh, uh, represent the resistant uh, candidates toward the specific uh, um, pathotypes. And just in comparison, uh, they found a much uh, fewer uh, candidates, resistant candidates uh, in Naples as opposed to uh, uh, Nigra, the bee genome. So that's, uh, um, that's quite exciting. You know, you have some um, candidates uh, resistant even to large number or, or even some more, all of the, those uh, pathotypes are identified. 
So they did the further work and that, that tried to map some of the the, the resistance genes in the um, uh, in those candidates and. Uh, um, I'll have to go a little bit uh, more quickly here. Now, in their mapping process, uh, this uh, um, the Rudebeck material, uh, they found uh, two um, genes on these two chromosomes. So I kind of highlight uh, them and uh, keep uh, that in mind when I go through the rest of the presentation. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, you will see the reasoning out of that. But what's interesting is that they define those genes on the two sections of, uh, of A3 and the section of A8, and, and that's from the Rudebega. And uh, continue on, they looked at the uh, uh, winter European variety, Tosca, um, which was uh, developed at the same time as a famous uh, variety, Mendel. They were from the same source, but they used a different uh, gene from what we call the U ECD4, uh, which is a, a, a U European collaborative uh, differential set. Uh, in this particular, particular case, they found that that uh, uh, resistance gene is, uh, is from a, a, A3, okay? Now A3 again. So then they look at the uh, a different uh, ECD um, variety uh, called ECD2, it's a it's a na na uh, rapa, rapa uh, variety, and, and uh, identify the two genes: one on A3, one on A8. Again, no same chromosome, and uh, and then uh, uh, continue the development of a mapping uh, population and try to zero into the exact the position. But again, especially this. Uh, um, Okay, I'll touch on that a little bit later, but uh, as you can see here, this, uh, these two genes are quite similar to some of the previously identified genes. So we're, we may not really looking at the two different varieties. Now continue on with the mapping work. Um, my colleague, Fen Cheng, um, in Saskatoon, she was dealing with the different uh, the, the pool of the resistance sources because many years ago, we screened a large number of, of uh, um, the germplasm. And she also looked at the, the CECD2 as a root of, uh, because of it, this is a very interesting source of resistance. They seem to be resistant against uh, all the 17 pathotypes we have identified on the prairies. And then uh, there are some other uh, materials, like she found a, a, a new, resistance gene in the Mendel, the original the Mendel variety, and also look at the uh, Oleracea uh, uh, candidate and another candidate uh, she obtained from the Netherlands. I will give a little bit of more details of that, and uh, uh, it will be brief. And uh, first, uh, she found uh, um, the, uh, the resistance gene, a major one, in the ECD2 seemed to be resistant to quite a, a few major uh, uh, pathotypes newly identified. Okay, and she used uh, you know, slightly different uh, mapping techniques, but again, the, uh, um, this particular gene, again, is on the AA chromosome. And instead, instead of causing confusion, she used the uh, you know, same uh, nomenclature she used, she used with a uh, name earlier gene, and just uh, with this uh, identification of the source from this particular, uh, the ECD2. So that's again, uh, AA resistant gene, I'm saying this fairly loosely. Um, another source she looked at was uh, the uh, winter uh, canola um, source from the Netherlands, and again, identified the resistant gene on the A8, and uh, she gave a the uh, designation of this particular source, but uh, still the gene is uh, quite uh, similar to the one she identified before called the RCR9. So again, we're dealing probably with a very similar uh, type of a resistance gene here. Then uh, again, 
that is a bit of the news. She found an, an additional gene with the Mendel that's on the A8, again, C A8. And uh, so that's an uh, um, additional gene, but not necessarily new. So either way, she kind of lined up all those things uh, on the A8. And uh, that's kind of a, you know, the range uh, those uh, the R genes uh, are uh, locating. They are pretty close. And it's hard to say they are different genes, but we don't know exactly um, what they are. But considering also with the, the A3 R genes identified similar to others, so we likely are looking at more names than the real, you know, different genes. And, and the, so that's the reality. All those mapping identification work has, uh, has a progress so far. Okay, then uh, she also looked at the C genome, at the Oleracea materials, uh, find uh, some slightly less effective R genes, but that's also against the whole range of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the different uh, pathotypes. Now, my colleague, uh, uh, the uh, canola breeder, uh, Habibur uh, at the U of A, uh, and he likes this uh, particular, uh, uh, the uh, uh, rutabaga variety, uh, Brookfield. And they identified the first, uh, the R gene out of it, and uh, again, on the AA uh, chromosome. And uh, then they continue work on this material, found another gene, on the A3 chromosome. So again, almost in the kind of a similar range of uh, uh, on the, those chromosomes. And he then switched quite a bit uh, efforts into uh, the, uh, uh, the Oleracea C genome and found that some QTL type of a, uh, the resistant uh, loci and keep uh, working on those things. And uh, um, he actually used the two sources of uh, Oleracea kale and the cabbage and, and bring them all into his uh, breeding uh, lines. The uh, overall progress has been a little bit of challenging because of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, stability of the population, but he's getting there. And some, those uh, genes are uh, kind of now in the neighbors' uh, the population uh, with a similar uh, uh, the seed production uh, as the real uh, neighbor's uh, parents. So that's that's a good news uh, uh, of the, this uh, this thing. And again, this uh, C genome uh, R gene seems to be resistant to a large number of uh, new pathotypes. Not so much with the old uh, 3H. That's a common one on the prairies, but it, on the the new. Uh, Pathotypes are quite resistant. The uh, now last come to my uh, uh, work, uh, and we more or less look at the the mechanism of uh, the resistant genes or gene combinations, and trying to figure out the best way to to combine them when you have a complementary um, mechanism. Uh, since I'm running out of time, so I'll be brief on those things. Uh, um, they keep in mind that uh, you know we have a different genes, especially as I mentioned, the three A, uh, A three and A eight. Uh, those are probably low hanging fruits that they, they are being picked up by the industry and have you know, gone into now varieties. But in terms of a resistance mechanism, the, those genes are probably pretty similar. And uh, they, they seem to, you know, once recognized by the pathogens, they activated the similar pathways. And uh, uh, it seems that, sorry, it seems that the lignin um, formation uh, around the, the cell wall, especially around the uh, endodermal cell wall, just outside the cortical tissue, that seems to be very um, characteristic in terms of the resistance. So then, uh, we verified that this uh, uh, process uh, of mechanism with the uh, uh, with the further uh, uh, tests of the gene expression uh, along the pathway. That seems to be fairly uh, clear, and those uh, ligand-related uh, uh, the pathways and they have been uh, uh, quite uh, significantly uh, activated. And then further look at the transcriptome uh, of this uh, um, those. Uh, 
the, between the, the genes and the susceptible ones. And it seems that uh, there are not a lot of a difference uh, uh, between the, uh, um, these two types of genes in terms of uh, the, uh, the, 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 our genes, uh, the genes uh, related in certain biological processes. And, uh, but it seems that the combining the genes from A3 and AA um, did not really provide us with additional modes of action in terms of uh, the resistance. But at the same time, it seems to only provide this uh, moderate resistance uh, to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the 5X uh, the pathotype. So in this case, our hypothesis was that the, uh, uh, this moderate resistance may not really last very long. And, and uh, so we did the, uh, the uh, resistance durability test with uh, this moderate resistance. This is just that the diagram showed the kind of a cycle of that uh, the testing. It was started with the you know, initial inoculum. It can be low and, uh, and high, but I go through the process of leaving the clubs in the soil, like let them disintegrate, they release the spores. Some of the spores will die, some will you know, continue on. But the theory is that the more resistant the, the lines are, the fewer spores will be left in the field, right? So this, we run this by five cycles, and, uh, and uh, then it shows that the moderate resistance seem to have a reasonable stability against this particular uh, pathotype. This is uh, the, um, the disease levels across the five uh, uh, cycles of exposure. But at the same time, you know, these are two uh, uh, lines with the, uh, with the dash lines uh, are the resistant ones. Uh, the others are not to this particular pathotype. But this shows the uh, inoculum in the soil, the change of the inoculum in the soil, it seems that the moderate resistance seems to be able to, to deter the uh, inoculum built up in the soil. And by doing this, it seems to maintain the resistance level uh, in the repeated exposure to the same source of inoculum. This, uh, this is the last slide uh, or part of it. And, uh, uh, and to uh, uh, 3H, uh, this uh, same exposure experiment, and we uh, have a lower initial inoculum start and a higher inoculum to start, but it seems that the lowering the inoculum help the um, the resistance the performance and the durability. It, it, the resistant varieties will last a little bit longer. So there is a, a, a positive side for um, combining use of the resistance with lowering your field inoculum for by doing the longer rotation to let the, the, the sports to, to, to disintegrate in the field, okay? With that, I think I, uh, sorry I used a little bit more time, but the, that's the, uh, the key uh, summary of it. And you know, through the program, we accumulated a, a good number of new sources for resistance. We have developed a new approach to um, estimate the resistance uh, uh, durability. So. We hope this uh, study will continue on and capture the, uh, the findings we've had. I think that uh, the people who, additional people need to be acknowledged at the funding agency. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Our next presentation will be Dr. Bruce Gossin from the AAFC. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bruce to the stage. Oh, that's a scroll. I like that. Okay. Um, so I'm, uh, my name's Bruce Coase, and I'm from Ag Canada, Saskatoon. I've been watching people struggling, and there's the light. I've been watching people struggling with the uh, with the, uh, with the lights in their face all all uh, all this week, and so I brought my shade to uh, <laughs> to give me a break here. Uh, 
I, th I thought it actually made quite a nice look, but uh, my, one of my colleagues uh, was explaining to me that I looked uh, actually less like uh, a, uh, an aging rock star, which is sort of what I thought, um, and um, more like a bewildered biker that was this, had stumbled into a meeting that he had no business attending. So I, maybe I'll lift the shades for just now, and we'll, uh, we'll carry on with, uh, with the presentation. This one's different, okay. Um, no wonder people are actually actually able to use the uh, use the clicker this this morning. It's different than uh, than earlier in the day. Sorry? No, no. I, I think I can make this one work. Uh, this is this is great. Now, uh, what uh, the the pillar that uh, Mary Ruth McDonald, my uh, uh, co-author on this presentation, and I have been co-leading is the is uh, Post pathogen interaction in the as part of uh, the cover pro protecting cap, and what the the main focus of that is about uh, mitigation. So uh, reading gets all the all the all the money and all the attention, but there are some real positive things that that, that can come out of mitigation. And just as an example of that, before we even get started, I want to just tell you about an example of mitigation for climate change that. Uh, that I thought I, I encountered recently, I thought was really interesting. And uh, this was uh, in response to a, a cyclone that occurred in Bangladesh in uh, 1970. Since 1970, the, the Bangladeshi government has been identifying uh, in each little district in, the, in Bangladesh uh, individual structures that are on high ground, uh, they're built to, uh, to withstand cyclone damage, and they're big enough to uh, to big enough to hold the people and livestock, the, the entire population of their little district. And uh, in following that, or as part of that cyclone damage in 1970, uh, they lost 300,000 people and untold numbers of animals. And uh, they had similar levels of flooding. This past year, I don't know if people were paying attention in the uh, in the news. Uh, instead of 300,000 people lost, they lost 30 people. Uh, that's not that that the storm was less severe. That's not that the flooding was less severe. It just meant that they they put a little bit of money into identifying things like schools and government buildings, sports facilities that could be used to, as 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 sanctuaries for people and animals made an, an enormous amount of difference. I'm not saying that we're going to save, save any lives with clever mitigation, but what, we may, what we're trying to do is to learn to live with this particular pathogen. OK, so, uh, and we've only got a few minutes. I've only got 12 minutes left. Uh, we've, we're talking about achievements. And uh, one of the, the, the main ideas is, is uh, stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection is an idea uh, where it's all about uh, maintaining whole genotypes in a, in a pathogen population. I'm going to explain that a little bit, but it's important because it gives the pathogen an opportunity to respond quickly to a new a new path uh, a new gene for resistance, a new host that comes in, and uh, this is uh, part of the reason, at least, why uh, why resistance breaks down so quickly in this particular pathogen. The other, uh, as associated with that, the importance of spore concentration, and we've done, uh, we've uh, made some improvements in the assessments, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, the, we, we're dealing with uh, identifying crop, the crop intervals that are needed to reduce spore numbers, uh, and uh, using patch management to make the approaches more, uh, more economic. Uh, Gary's just talked about improving uh, resistance durability. That some of that work was part of this project. And then we've assessed a number of really out there kind of, kind of possibilities, including uh, use of things like endophytes, application of uh, boron, and and a, a, you know some of them have worked really well or have at least potential. Others not so much. What we have here, we're going to talk about stabilizing selection, and this is the this is the data that led us to uh, this this particular. Uh, this particular hypothesis about how how club root works, and what we have here is is a situation where we've got uh, 
uh, sequences of isolates collected before and after a change of pathotype. Now, what we'd expect to see this and the, the each of the lines there is is a particular gene, and where they're very very similar across all of the uh, the lines, they're blue. When they're very very different, they're red. You can see that there's a lot of difference among those lines. And what we're seeing, uh, what, what we're looking at is. In, in a, a normal population, you'd expect that the before and afters would be very similar. And in fa so that whole graph should be, or that whole uh, heat map should be blue. And instead, we've got lots and lots of reds in it. 50% of the SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, identified before and after are different. That means not that there's been a single small change, that means there's been a wholesale change in the genotype. And how that works, is a little like this. And I've stolen this from a presentation that uh, Clint made in, a number of years ago, and I really liked it, all except for the fact that the, uh, the zoospores should be white instead of brown. But except for that small thing, uh, he did a really neat job of this. Uh, so we're talking about a root there where that's resistant to pathotypes A, B, and C. But not, uh, but is susceptible to D, and A, B, and C are at high frequency. D, there's just one. That's a, a very low frequency uh, pathotype. But uh, when you look at the infected uh, uh, clubs out of that, out of that uh, field that would be in that situation, most of the uh, pathogen in the uh, in the club would be pathotype D. But there would be other t other pathotypes there as well. And here is just uh, at low levels, pathotype B. So it's carrying that whole pathotype genotype forward in the population. And like I said, the reason for that that's important is because the uh, of of a breakdown of resistance. Now, uh, the, with one of the things we identified fairly early on about club root was that it's all about the numbers. And uh, here we've got an example of how uh, uh, disease severity increases with, uh, with uh, the increased pathogen populations. There's a little note to it in the bottom to say that, uh, that, that this is not carved in stone, that it varies with uh, environmental situation and soil type and yada, yada, yada. But the main thing is that at low populations, you get very, very, few, sp uh, very few symptoms. At uh, higher levels, you get massive, massive clubs and massive uh, loss of yield and uh, even plant survival. And in this particular uh, instance, heavily infested patches of soil often have greater than 10 million spores per gram. So uh, you can see that they're way above the level that's required for uh, massive disease loss. Uh, We'd like to be able to change spore load, but changing spore load isn't that isn't all that easy, uh, and it's really difficult to change it quickly. Lyme uh, reduces club root, but uh, likely by inhibiting spore germination, it doesn't change the numbers of spores in the soil. In even fumigants, as we've and we've really tried, don't uh, don't eliminate the pathogen. So uh, th both of those and both of those approaches are really expensive. The solution, if you're going to use them at all, you need to use them only on the places where that are actually infested. Leave the rest of the field alone. The other thing about a high spore concentration is that it, uh, it the, these high spore concentrations actually, while they increase disease pressure and disease um, uh, severity and are associated with breakdown of resistance. The reason they're associated with breakdown of resistance is if you've got uh, a genotype that, could, that uh, can break down that resistance and it's at one in a million, even one in 10 million, that means there's a, at, at 10 million spores per gram, there's a, a pathotype that, like that in every gram of soil. That means there's hundreds of thousands of them in a field. And that's, that's why they quickly build up. There's also yield loss that is, that's associated with, uh, with re even with resistant plants. They're working so hard to, to battle the pathogen that there is a measurable yield loss. And it makes other things like liming and, uh, and uh, intermediate resistance much less effective. 
in terms of uh, spore survival, we'll, we'll just jump to the data for that. The uh, spores decline quickly over the first couple of years and then it sort of levels out. This is, uh, I want, to, want you to note this is a log scale on the side. So it's actually a log scale, a straight line in a log scale means there's an exponential decrease in spore numbers. So we're going from 10 to the 7, which would be tens of millions of spores per, uh, per gram, maybe down to 10 to the 6 or even 10 to the 5 over the first couple of years, and then it sort of levels out. That, and we've shown that in a number of different, uh, different sites. One of the things that uh, we thought might be uh, important in terms of for increasing the, the pace of that spore reduction uh, would be the effect of, uh, of grasses. Uh, here we're looking at uh, different cultivars of perennial ryegrass and uh, brome grasses, meadow brome and smooth brome, and comparing them with uh, uh, barley and, and wheat. And in that second experiment, there was a ryegrass as well. What we're showing is that, yes, it does have a, uh, an effect, and it does reduce spore numbers under controlled conditions. But the main thing to notice was the reduction from how many spores we put on just in bare soil under optimum conditions in the, in the greenhouse. And uh, there was a dramatic, dramatic reduction and then uh, with just over time, and then a small reduction, increased reduction uh, associated with the crops. When we take that into the field, uh, we've got uh, a fairly small, uh, this, this is actually a, a, a complex experiment. I'm, I'm not going to explain all the details of it, but the, the take home message is the final dots there at, in 2022. And that is that there's not going to be uh, a, a huge amount of difference associated with liming. These are uh, regular, regular lime and, and hydrated lime, it's not quick lime. Compared with, the, uh, compared with the presence of a grass. The reason that the grass is important is not even that it, uh, that it drives down the spore numbers, it's, a keep, it's that it keeps spores in place, that you're not having, that the, instead of having an entire field infested, you've got just a little patch and you know exactly where it is. There's some real advantage to that. In, in my quite less than humble opinion, this is a, uh, a picture of one of the first patches of club root that was, uh, that was uh, identified in Alberta. And there's uh, a couple of things to, uh, to take home from that. First, you know, that, that the, uh, s some of these patches can be quite small when they start off. And so uh, if you can catch the, catch the disease before it gets uh, widespread in the field, it's a lot easier to deal with. The second part of that, is that you have to be sure to, if you're treating patches, you have to be sure to get it all because the disease spreads quickly on equipment especially. And, uh, and so you've got to be sure that you're, that you're treating at least most of these patches if you're gonna, gonna do it at all. Uh, overall, over the course of the five years, we've looked at, I said a lot of things. Crop rotation seems to be a really good approach, a cost-effective approach to, uh, to uh, disease management. Grassing uh, has some, some real benefits in terms of keeping the, the, the spores in place. Liming and fumigation could have an impact on actual disease, but they're very expensive to, to apply. Uh, some of the other things we looked at not, uh, didn't work as well. There's uh, uh, individual projects right now going on uh, things like solarization, application of, of boron to increase plant uh, Reduce plant susceptibility to club root, and reducing c compaction to make the uh, the situation less uh, less compatible for club root. Gary's work on durability of resistance, I think, is tremendously interesting. And uh, you guys have seen this, those acknowledgments. And I was with, uh, and th there we are for questions. If, I know we don't, we're not going to be talking directly, but if people have questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. Thanks very much.
we are nearing close to the end of today's meeting. We have a few final speakers left, so that in mind, we do ask that the presenters can keep to their 15 minute window or so. I know everybody has. Hello. Hello. Oh, good. You're there. All right. The stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I have very much enjoyed all the presentations so far. I want to start by making a friendly challenge to Susie Lee that I think I deserve the title for the shortest presenter because I'm only 5'3 when I'm wearing my high heel. So I think that title belongs to me. Anyway. I'm going to start my talk then uh, by uh, just uh, reminding you of the topic. It's going to be on biological control of cabbage seed for weevils in the prairies. And next, I would like to uh, uh, show you the, the rest of the team, if I can advance the slides. There we are. So this is a pretty large team. Uh, we have collaborators in Quebec. Uh, the uh, Université de, Mo de Quebec à Montréal, we have Jean-Pierre Jean Blavary and Eric Lucas, they're professors there, and they have two graduate students, Mar Marie Lotavio and Claudine de Roche, and then we, the rest of the people in Central are, are with Canada. Uh, we have Pat Bouchard and uh, Peter Mason in Ottawa and also Tara Gaviette in London. And in Saskatchewan, we have Megan Bankowski and her technician Jonathan Williams. And then in uh, Alberta, we have Dan Johnson at the University of Lethbridge, and he and I have a student, Peter uh, Tripa, Jagatin Soaran. So that is the team. Now let's discuss the problem. So the cabbage seed for weevil is a uh, chronic pest of canola in the southern prairies. It's quite common for farmers to spray for it in southern Alberta and also in southern Saskatchewan. It is moving into the um, more traditional canola growing regions. Uh, it's now also in Manitoba and it's also in the parkland area. But fortunately, it's not establishing very high populations yet. And uh, that's a good thing. So what kind of damage does the cabbage seed for weevil cause? Uh, you can see there there is an adult that uh, they, they arrive uh, when the canola field is an early flower and they lay an egg it's one egg, fortunately, in, in a pod, and then the larva will consume about three to six seeds. And that consumption can translate into actual yield losses uh, once you have more than two weevils per sweep or 20 to 40 weevils in 10 sweeps. You can get uh, about two bushels per acre in terms of yield losses, so it is, it is significant. and. And we do have an economic threshold that we just published a couple of years ago, and the, the threshold is around three three weevils per sweep. Uh, what do farmers do in terms of control? Well, the only thing they do right now is spray insecticides, and uh, they, they most of them are following those thresholds, and they are spraying an insecticide at early flower. There is something else that farmers can do, and this is the research that was supported by the Canola Economic Research Program many years ago. And we develop a trap crop system, and you can see on this image here, if you have an early flowering border of canola, and in this case it was planted in the fall, but you could also plant it in the spring. And then the rest of the crop, uh, about 90% of the area, the, uh, the main crop to be protected. So the control zone, if you like, happens here, and this is where you'd be spraying insecticides. And not many farmers are using this system, unfortunately. And that is because it was not very convenient to be harvesting twice. 
However, with the advent of more varieties that are shutter resistant and more uh, diversity in terms of flowering times from different cultivars, I think now there is a better fit. Um, I'm hoping that I will see more farmers trying that and reducing the amount of insecticides. Well, what about biological control? Well, let's talk about biological control and let's do a, a quick biocontrol 101 uh, lecture and let's define what is it. Uh, biocontrol has to do with the use of natural enemies and there are three kinds in general. We have microbes uh, like fungi, like Bulgaria vaciana or metabysium. Uh, you can see here a cabbage seed for weevil and I think that this is one of my photos. Uh, many years ago we found uh, uh, an isolate of Bulgaria vaciana that was local and it's quite effective at healing uh, cabbage seed for weevils, at least in the lab. Uh, there is also another fungus that is quite effective. It's a metarisium, and Dan Johnson has uh, has discovered a strain that actually works even when you have temperatures of 48 degrees Celsius. It can still kill ligus bugs and grasshoppers. Um, I I assume it also will kill cabbage for river food. I don't know if it, if it's tested that. Okay, the other category of uh, natural enemies that we are quite familiar with is the generally striatos. And here we have a nice photo taken by Dan Johnson, who's a great photographer. And you can see uh, a wolf spider, or maybe it's another kind of spider. Anyway, this spider is it, uh, interesting that it's missing a leg. You can see here it's missing a leg. Still, it managed to catch a ligus bug and it's going to make it uh, its dinner. There's lots of uh, generally striatos. Uh, Karabi beetles, papilinids, uh, ladybird beetles, those are all generally spreaders and it's important to conserve them. And that's why we always remind growers to follow economic thresholds very strictly. Okay, the third category and is the one that concerns us the most here is the parasitoids. And you may ask, what is a parasitoid? Well, a parasitoid is like a parasite. Uh, it will attack uh, insects and it will kill them. So that's why they are like parasites. You know, if you have a tick on a cow, a mosquito biting you, you don't die. But if you have a, if you're a cave sip or weevil and you have a little wasp by Trichomalus perfectus putting an egg inside you, you're in trouble because uh, uh, the, the larva is going to suck the juices out of uh, the larva of the pest and it's going to die. So, this is what we have been studying and why did we develop an interest in Trichomalus perfectus, uh, this little wasp? It actually started, uh, oh, one, one too many, it started, um, we, we knew that uh, in Europe they had this parasitoid, but we didn't know that it was in Quebec a few years ago, or actually uh, more than a few years ago now. Uh, this lady here, uh, Dr. jean Vieve Lavry, she published a popular article in Top Crop Manager East and I read there that uh, she had found high levels of parasitism by this, this parasitoid. And interestingly, entomologists at the time were, were doing studies and looking at uh, the potential of introducing it from Europe to Canada. And luckily, somehow, it, it immigrated by itself because it's a welcome immigrant. And it's well established in Quebec, as we can see from this graph here. Uh, Jean Vieb was uh, documenting rates of parasitism up to 100% in some cases, but uh, quite a few fields were were uh, hosting this parasit at a very high level. So, and they also noted that uh, this anecdotally, these farmers did not have to spray for the KVC for weevil in Quebec when they had a high level of parasit. So, obviously, we were interested in this, and we we wanted to move it to. Uh, to the prairies, and some of you may ask, well, why don't you just go to Quebec and get it in your bag and bring it back and release it? Well, yes, I could do that, and legally I probably wouldn't go to jail for doing that because there are no laws in Canada yet that prevents us from doing that. However, I do have an ecological and, and ethical conscience, and I know that there are lots of potential issues with the moving uh, organisms around, even within the same country, because if you think of how large Canada is and compared it to Europe, you'd be crossing several countries and several jurisdictions and lots of uh, uh, hurdles. And the main thing is that we have a community of uh, biodiversity in, in the prairies and we want to protect that community also. And we don't want to cause more problems like the ones that happen when somebody introduced the seven spotted ladybird beetles into the US to control aphids and look at what happened. Now we're losing our ladybird beetles. Uh, anyway, 
So that's why we we propose to do this uh, this study as part of the cluster, and the general goal is to to conduct an ecological, economic, and environmental assessment to support or reject the relocation of Trichomatus perfectus to the prairies. So, with that in mind, let me give you some uh, some of the highlights of what we've been up to. Uh, as part of the ecological studies, uh, there is a PhD student, Marie Lotavio, and also in, in Lethbridge uh, University, Pira uh, Tipa um, uh, They have conducted landscape studies in the two regions, and uh, that information is going to be very important as far as determining where are the best habitats to release the parasitoid. And uh, the data from Alberta suggests that uh, fields where there are water bodies those would be the best because we are finding uh, high levels of, uh, well, not high levels, we are finding some parasitoids and, and low levels of parasitoids in those areas, so we suspect that those would be the, the spots. I'm not going to talk about the details here, there is no time, so I'm going to highlight the work in Alberta quickly. And this data here tells us that uh, the levels of parasitism of cabbage seed for weevil in Alberta are very similar to what Lloyd Dostal reported about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And we consider there's less than 15% of parasitism. So the native parasitoids uh, are finding the wheel, but they are not really increasing the numbers to the level where they can actually control the wheel. So obviously there is a niche for Trichomalus perfectus for an exotic parasitoid to help us control the wheel. And what are the native weevils that we may have in Canada and especially in the prairies? Well, the, the uh, weevils, the family Curculionidae, if you like uh, etymological terms, it's a very diverse family and you are going to find lots of weevils. But here we are interested in, in native weevils that occur in Brassicacea plants. Those are the ones that could be at risk of non-target effects by the introduction of the Precomalus perfectus parasitoid. So, what we are doing or we have done is, uh, is illustrated by the data collected by Dan Johnson and also Megan Van Koski has collected similar data. But here Dan collected over 100,000 pods from various Brassicacea plants as suggested here. And then he put them in containers, bags and reared whatever insects came out. And the insects that I'm showing you here are the ones that were collected with sweep nets in various habitats. So those are not the key ones. The key ones are the ones that came out from these pods. And uh, interestingly, only eight beetles came out, and I think only, only one species. Uh, it was Ceterinchus neglectus, which is, there's, um, I don't think there's a common name for it. It's uh, similar to the Cave C4 weevil. It's a tiny kind of uh, greenish, um, very, very shiny beetle. Anyway, now I'm going to show you uh, data from all the areas, and here we, we have Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, with some notes there. And here is the, the most common native weevil is, is when I just said, Citorincus neglectus. And in fact, Lloyd Dostal published a study in 2012 where he suggested that this weevil is so common that sometimes it enters canola and it could be considered a minor pest. So I don't think that's a weevil that would be a conservation concern. Uh, there is this, this uh, native weevil, Citorincus omissus, uh, that is in Ontario and it seems to be parasitized by Trichomalus perfectus to some extent. In Alberta, we haven't found it. Uh, it should occur, but it seems to be very rare. And this is another one. Uh, this, this is an exotic weevil on shepherd's furs. And this one, uh, Sutorincus americanus, I believe it's a native weevil, but it's not a host. Something I want to highlight as an outcome of this study is that in Quebec, they identified uh, Sutorincus pallidactylus, and this weevil is the most important pest of spring canola in Europe. So I thought it was interesting, and we should highlight that it's already in Quebec. So hopefully, it's not going to move uh, to the prairies because we already have enough headaches with insects in the prairies. Now, this data comes from Ontario. Uh, again, we can see here uh, Sutorincus omissus. This is a native weevil. And I've highlighted it in red here because it has high levels of parasitism. You can see up to 90%. But the good news is that most of that parasitism comes from another native wasp, Mesopolobus morioides, uh, which is uh, it's not something that we would be concerned about because we fully expect to see these kind of relationships between native insects. So, uh, so far, it's looking good. And I'm going to show you the final piece of data 
Uh, this is a very nice study conducted by Colleen de Roche, where she, she did two things. She documented the assemblages of the weevils in, uh, in, in the uh, Brassicase plants, similar to what we're doing elsewhere. And that work is already published in environmental entomology. And the other thing that I, I found really interesting is that they uh, rear inside these boxes, they rear, they stuff them with the Brassicase plants. And then they, they documented what parasitoids, what wasps came out. And they found a total of 110 wasps. And only two of them were actually Trichomalus uh, perfectus. One of them came out of uh, Neglectus, which is, in my mind, is not a major concern. Uh, another one, which could be a bit more concerned, is uh, Chikorinthus type, because this one has been proposed as a potential biological control of shepherd's first. However, in the thesis, she also documented that uh, Trichomalus perfectus does not even parasitize the cave seaport weevil in these refugia, in these uncultivated areas. We suggest that it doesn't seem to like to get out of the canola field. That's a very well behaved parasite. So, another big, big uh, bonus for, uh, for Trichomalus perfectus. So, should we relocate it or not? Um, I, I'm going to summarize this discussion here. Yes. Trichomalus perfectus is oligophagous, meaning that it attacks other weevils. It doesn't have a very strict host range. However, it does have a more specialized host range in terms of its, its niche. It will only attack the weevils that are that are attacking seeds of Brassicacea plants and only Brassicacea plants. So that's really important. Therefore, we do not expect a major effect. Uh, there are going to be some some impacts, but they are going to be negligible on, on non-targets. And also, it's important to keep in mind that we need all we need to do a cost-benefit analysis. What if we do nothing? Well, if we do nothing, then we continue to to see the widespread use of insecticides that we all know that has environmental, economic, and also health costs. So there are going to be some negative impacts of the parasitoid and the local fauna, but those should be small and the the benefic benefits of the biological control agent we expect will outweigh the impact of the high insecticide use if we don't do anything. So the next step for this big team is to complete the data analysis. We had some uh, delays because of COVID like everybody else. And uh, once we analyze all the data and synthesize it, uh, we're going to consider putting a uh, petition for relocation of trichomalus perfectus. And the last thing I need to do is to thank everybody. Uh, first, I, I always uh, remind myself that all this work is not possible without the help of all these students and technicians, college students. So big thank you to them. And also a big thank you to all the funding agencies, uh, the CAP program, our uh, funding from the government, uh, the Canola Council for all the administration work they do, and the commissions, Alberta, Tikashi, and Manitoba for um, giving some of their money for this research. And thank you for listening. There is time at, at the q and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Hector. And thanks to all of this afternoon's speakers so far. And um, we're gonna have a Q&A later, but, but first of all, our, our final three speakers are gonna be from theme seven of the cluster, and that's dealing with the black leg and verticillium projects, so. Uh, our next speaker I'd like to invite up is Dr. Hossein Borhan from AAFC Saskatoon. And he's going to be talking about the genetic resistance of Brassica nevis against black leg and verticillium. So summarizing two different projects. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I have, under the CAP cluster project, I have uh, working on two diseases, black leg and verticillium stripe. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is under three activities. Uh, the first activity was to look at the race specific resistance genes on, um, against black leg, RLM3, 4, 7, and 9, clone those genes and develop uh, uh, Allele specific markers. Uh, uh, these uh, three genes are located on uh, chromosome 7. They are tightly clustered together and it has been always difficult to tease them apart. Uh, so, the first thing that we cloned was RLM9, 
and this uh, gene was, uh, we used the um, uh, uh, Darwin genome sequence that was out, and Darwin has got RLM9, we look at the interval. We identified the only gene that we could identify that was uh, uh, a possible candidate was a wall-associated kinase. At the time, there was not much information about this uh, group of proteins as our gene, uh, so I think this was the second gene to be, to be known as, as a um, resistant gene. So we cloned the gene, the genomic clone, we, uh, we put it in uh, Vestar that is susceptible, and as you see on the right panel, uh, I don't know if I can, no, how do, sorry. Uh, so the right panel shows that uh, uh, Vestar that has been transgenic with RLM9 become resistant against, when, against the isolate that has got AV, matching AVRLN gene, AVR59. And wild type Vestar is susceptible, of course, and also Vestar transgenic is susceptible against the isolate that doesn't have the uh, matching AVR genes. The bottom panel on the left uh, shows the in expression of these genes. They are really pick up at after uh, infection. Uh, we cloned also AVR uh, LM59, and uh, AVR LM59's recognition by RLM9 is masked in the presence of another AVR gene, AVR LM47. So we wanted to see what's happening here. We did a use to hybrid to see that if the AVR LM47 and AVR LM59 interacting, and we couldn't find this interaction. Also, we look at the direct interaction of AVR LM59 with AVR LM9. That was we couldn't detect that interaction. We look at uh, if uh, RLM9, uh, basically, and uh, uh, if, if the uh, uh, AVRLM59 recognize subdomains of things, so we look at the kinase domain, we look at the, uh, uh, all of those individually, and we couldn't, we couldn't find interaction. So that's the enigma that how the recognition happens, actually. So uh, the second gene that we cloned, uh, the two second genes were RLM4 and RLM7. We, uh, we have topaz RLM4 and topaz RLM7 generated in the lab. This topaz is susceptible. These are integration line by back crossing that we have generated. And we sequenced RLM4 and RLM7. We, then we used the Darmor genome to have a reference-based assembly. We did extensive RNA sequencing and annotated the genes in within the interval RLM4 and RLM7 was uh, located. We identified another wall-associated kinase, uh, and it was highly expressed. This is uh, the same family of genes as, as RLM9. The gene is humongous. It has a 6KB uh, intron, uh, the, and also so the whole gene was about 11KB that we had to transform. Uh, so the, we use Vestar again, and I don't know how to use my uh, basically to, to show it here, but but as you see on uh, uh, transgenic Vestar that has got RLM4, they are becoming resistant against uh, isolate with AVRLM47. Uh, they are not becoming resistant against isolated AVRLM7 as is expected, so it shows that it's a specificity of RLM4 because these two genes are allelic, they are right on the top of each other. So we wanted to make sure that what we are cloning is specific to each of those isolate. So RLM7 uh, transgenic line respond to R AVRLM47 as expected, and also it responds to RLM uh, AVR7 isolate. And uh, we put AVRLM, uh, we put RLM9 over there to make sure it's another wall-associated kinase. So we make sure that there is no, uh, basically, again, uh, confirm the specificity of the gene. Again, the genes are highly expressed after infection. The corresponding AVR genes also expressed after infection, but it sort of the expression tapers off uh, at about six to nine days. So we. Uh, mm, Created uh, obviously we created RLM4 and RLM7 integration line by backcrossing to Topaz. We uh, generated backcross five self uh, three generation, and this seed has been distributed and is available for anyone that who is interested. We also at the same time uh, the group of Jackie Batley in Australia they had a they uh, sequence 127 uh, Brassicanapus. So they knew that we have cloned these genes. They wanted to look at this, and we look at the variation with for RLM4, RLM7, and we identified basically a domain, the GOP domain, with that to be the most variable, probably involved in recognition, and we find additional RLM7 and uh, RLM71 and RLM72 allele. 
also Jackie uh, and Angela, they use this data uh, to find SNP markers. So we have now SNP markers. They published a paper uh, in agronomy uh, journal. And so we have uh, markers for RLM7, markers for RLM9, markers for RLM4. They have developed markers for RLM3, uh, sorry, for RL, LFR3 and RLM2. So we have uh, basically just complement the cast marker that my lab has developed uh, a couple of years ago, and that was the intention of this project. Uh, we look at uh, uh, just recently. This is this is just out of the, this couple of days ago. Basically, this is we think we have RLM3. RLM3 was really a, a challenge for us. Uh, because uh, it's an interesting story. So it could be a little bit twist in RLM3. Uh, I can't talk about it right now too much, but uh, based on this data, on the left uh, panel is Vestar wild type. On the right is Vestar RLM3. And as you see, we have a robust resistant. So we have RLM3 cloned, uh, very likely. Uh, we look at the um, uh, AVRLM47 uh, and uh, AVRLM47, AVRLM7, uh, AVRLM9, and AVRLM3 distribution. We use data from Ralph Lang in uh, Alberta. This is four years data until 2017. And as you see, RLM3 is, AVRLM3 is highly prevalent. It's about 95%. AVRLM9 is about 85%. AVRLM47 and 7 together is actually more than 98% of the isolate they have it. Is about one and a half percent isolate that they don't have AVRLM47 or AVRLM7, but they have AVRLM3 and 9. This is good news for AVRLM for RLM4 and RLM7 genes, so they, they, we are expecting they highly to be effective. It's a bad news for RLM3 and RLM9 because AVRLM47 presence make recogn mask recognition of R RLM3 and RLM9, so it basically makes those genes useless. So we have to really come up with a scenario to, to, to rotate these things in, in a sensible way to make the best use of these four genes. Uh, the next project is on genetics of, uh, and genomics of napus resistance to verticillium longiosporum. So uh, we use the NAM population the, the, that this morning presentation, Sally talked about it, and we identified a range of phenotype against these NAM, uh, uh, NAM lines. We used uh, one of the NAM that was highly resistant, NAM14, at the very most left, uh, and the NAM53 that was highly susceptible. We, uh, we, here is the left tunnel shows that uh, the microscopy image. We, uh, we see that in our resistant line in the root, there is very little uh, pathogen growth. In the stem, is hardly, we can see it at four, four weeks post-inoculation. Then uh, we have uh, extensive growth in the susceptible one, that is NAM53, and uh, we, uh, sorry, and so we see that the NAM14 NAM is highly resistant, very plants are living happily, and NAM53 is almost uh, decimated. So uh, we use uh, these two public lines, we use the road to F1, and then we develop dapel haploid, about 200 lines. We used greenhouse uh, pathology. We did one round, and Ralph Lang in uh, Inotego, Alberta, did another round. Uh, and we uh, mapped the gene on, the, we, have, we have one major uh, uh, QTL on top of C5. We have several insignificant QTL. The reason for it is that really the uh, pathology data with verticillium is a nightmare, and the accuracy of the data affect what, what uh, the resolution of your genes. So we are doing additional uh, pathology tests to resolve those additional genes that we, we have here. Uh, so uh, we are also conducting transcriptome uh, at 1, 4, 7, and 14 days post-inoculation. The RNA has been extracted and is being sequenced. We, we use 19,000 genes from the verticillium and just from uh, uh, species that was sequenced, and we have did extensive database search. We have, we have a set of genes that are verticillium specific. They, are, they can differentiate. They are not in other fungi. They can differentiate between verticillium, longiosporum, and other verticillium species. And we have also uh, the markers, a cast marker that differentiate verticillium from other fungi. Uh, the last part of the project is about uh, uh, developing a high uh, rapid screening for uh, um, adult plant resistance for QTL against black leg. Um, uh, QTL is uh, 
basically the conventional method for QTL is field test. And field test is really long time, is inaccurate, and especially in, in the case when the, when the disease pressure is low. So, and uh, usually it is highly variable and Im impacted by many other factors. So we wanted to see indoor, uh, how is the indoor test will do. There has been a report of indoor, uh, doing this indoor, but they have never have done it as sort of map it or do extensive research. They have just, people have used, and what we do, we did, we did a natural, uh, the, unless some people, they, they just uh, basically cut the cartilidon and just uh, drop the inoculum on the petiole or they inject the spores in the stem. But what we did, we did the, what happens naturally in the field. We infected the cartilidon and grow the plant in the growth chamber. So we use a, a, a isolate that was virulent. And we use castle and topaz. The population castle is, has got the QTL in it, and we have four years of field data for, it, for this uh, population from, from Australia under the field. So it was a really good candidate population. Castle and topaz behaved resistant and susceptible with one single isolate. Then we used the subpopulation. We, were, we visited the, with the segregation. That, that was encouraging. Then we had 200 lines uh, of brassica napus from PGRC that didn't have a single origin. They, they were all susceptible to cartilage. We used our single isolate to screen those lines, and we identified 54 lines that with QTL. We later on add the 54 QTL with, with the susceptible at about a population of 120. We did the GVAS. We found one major QTL on A8. An interesting point that is A8 QTL is present in all the field uh, things. So several, not only in Castle, in others. So this was encouraging. We identified the right gene through the uh, basically growth chamber assay. We have a CAS marker for it at the top that you see differentiate nicely between the two parents. So to just move quickly. Then we want to say that what happens if you use a multiple isolate? We use three isolate. Again, we use Castle. We use Darmor. Both of them has got QTL in them against Black Lake. And we use DH12075, Vestal, and Topaz. They are all susceptible. As you see, the, we, even with three isolates, the, uh, this uh, line is holding very, uh, very well. We, we see very little lesion on Castle and Darmor and we see extensive lesion on, on our susceptible. We see a range of phenotype, as you see on the left, Cassid is happily growing. Uh, we see plant that uh, developmentally are very retarded and uh, they hardly actually produce seeds and we see plants that are actually dying. So three isolate worked. The next question is how many more isolate? Ralph did uh, this with 11 isolate. But see, we, send, we send him that 54 lines, not all of them, 40 something that we have seed from it. And as you see, uh, here we have this, this graph has got two type of uh, data. Is the blue lines, the blue bars are lesion on the leaves because he wanted to make sure that we have infection. And the orange uh, bars are lesion of stem lesion, that for, for QTL. So, and we see that half of our population has got a really good, I mean, decent, basically less than 50% lesion size. And some of them are really, really strong. So it's encouraging even against of your 11 isolate a virulent isolate, this, some, most of these lines are holding up. We then did a field test and on, in Manitoba in the Carman, uh, and half of the lines were again showing a good level of resistance. Some of them, even uh, if you see the second line, uh, the, the very far left is the castle as a control, and we see some of the lines are even, even better than castle under, uh, under field condition. So the bottom line is that, okay, GC-based AP, uh, APR could be used as an alternative. I think uh, it's, it's valid uh, it's, it's, and uh, it should be uh, re replacing the field data, uh, field uh, survey. Uh, uh, so it, we can do four or four, five cycle in a year compared to one cycle in a year for, for a field uh, APR assay. And the data are more robust because we are really challenging the pathogen with, with ordinary, under optimal condition and is reproducible because it's under controlled condition. And the thing is that this, the line that coming out of this screening are actually more robust and they are highly, they, they highly likely that we'll, they will be effective under, under several field condition and different places because they have gone to the extreme in terms of selection. So uh, with that, I would like to thank the people in the lab. Uh, that on the left, the people in the lab that did the work. Nick Larkin is, has got his own group now. He's a research scientist in Canada doing the pulse genomics. 
our co co collaboration with Ralph, uh, Isabel Parkin, Christina Eink, and also Andrea Tiedemann in uh, uh, George Augustus University in Germany. And of course, uh, this work was not possible without funding from Saskin Law, Alberta Canoe Law, uh, AFC, and uh, the um, uh, management and color, uh, basic coordination by uh, um, Canoe Council of Canada. Thank you very much, and yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Hossein. Uh, I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Doug Heath, the research manager at SAS Canola. And our, our next uh, speaker on black leg verticillium is Gary Peng, and he'll be talking about uh, new information on the infection window and quantitative resistance for black leg of canola. Good. I will have a fewer slides this time, so try not to go over time. Um, well, black leg is very common on the prairies, and we all know that. It, it, it doesn't just affect the production um, and also affect the, uh, the export. Uh, and and uh, we, we've heard all those uh, stories before. So this uh, talk uh, actually uh, covers uh, three uh, small projects uh, um, with, the, with a gap, uh, with, with a cap pro uh, program. Um, looking at uh, the critical infection uh, window and, uh, and the impact of, uh, of a flea beetle feeding, and this may sound a little bit odd, but I'll explain, and, and also a method of uh, screening for quantitative resistance. Uh, um, Hossein covered a little bit of a, a different method there. Uh, you may be wondering why critical, why the infection window, didn't we know that already? Um, yes or no? You know, um, and the early information um, was from Europe, uh, and uh, it uh, it says the you know both uh, sexual and asexual spores are landed on uh, leaves that can infect the uh, um, the plant, the intact the tissue, as long as we have the moisture or leaf wetness of up to the 16 hours and at 20 degrees Celsius. It all sounds good in Europe, you know, condition, and, and where a fall canola would have those uh, continuous you know, misty rain and, and, and the res reasonable temperature, but on the prairies, it's not very often we'll have that kind of a inf in condition for infection, right? And then we um, ask, you know, the question that, you know, um, what else uh, um, is happening uh, in our condition? And we notice uh, regularly uh, in, in, in the lab, we, when we inoculate the, uh, the leaves uh, with a wound, um, we don't even need to provide any uh, moisture condition. Um, and, and plus, uh, the, uh, the further work uh, showed that uh, the fresh wounds, uh, um, younger than um, four hours, uh, uh, from the wounding uh, becomes a very uh, uh, becomes less less susceptible. So we we uh, we started realizing that the wounding is important for for infection or very uh, helpful for the infection. So what does that uh, have anything anything to do with the the things in the field? Uh, then we think we look at the. Uh, the wounding happening in the field, what caused it, and we've heard a lot about the flea beetles, and that, that's a certainly a common thing in the early spring uh, on the prairies. And then our hypothesis was that uh, um, and the probably with those wounds, and, and, uh, and the pathogen doesn't need a lot of moisture to, to infect on the prairies, right? Since especially when we have much shorter growing season than a lot of other areas. Um, so with that the hypothesis, we set up a, a study um, in collaboration with uh, um, Dalantha Fernando at the U of M and hired uh, a postdoc to work on this. And, and what we try to do is to 
uh, use in crop uh, application of insecticide, try to reduce the feeding damage and to see if that will reduce the infection by black light. And we have around uh, um, nine station year trials at the three locations. And the results are a little bit different from what we expected. And uh, uh, this is just an example from the 2019 trials uh, with the two locations. The, uh, uh, the insecticide uh, spray, um, we spray it quite intensively, you know, three to five days uh, apart. And, and uh, it, it did uh, reduce the population. Look at this uh, uh, purple, uh, red, uh, uh, down arrows, and, and those treatments does reduce the population or damage uh, by uh, by flea beetle. Although it may not be the common practice to use, but it, it certainly suppresses the population. But at the same time, that reduction of the feeding damage did not really translate into the disease reduction. And this shows on this uh, this uh, graph here. And uh, and what I, what, what affected the disease level there was actually the resistant variety. And these are three other resistant varieties. And these two, uh, these three are susceptible um, West Star. So what we uh, uh, figure out is that, you know, um, the uh, in-crop insecticide application is not going to work in terms of uh, reducing uh, black leg uh, infection, so we probably should not even uh, we should not um, recommend that. Um, and, and the really the use of a resistant variety in this case was apparently uh, uh, the most effective uh, um, measure. Uh, so that results seem to be very consistent uh, across uh, um, across those station years, and and uh, then we. Um, uh, we 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 thought about you know why why was that uh, and one of the factors there is uh, to uh, encourage a disease uh, development uh, we, uh, we we use a quite heavy uh, uh, inoculum level and all those uh, uh, trial years we left the stubble uh, in the field we had uh, uh, West Star stubble uh, prior uh, to the start of the of uh, the experiment. And that, you know, heavy uh, in our column level may, uh, uh, in that case, uh, you know, the severity of a feeding damage may not really make a difference for black leg infection. So we did a, a quick uh, greenhouse experiment that seems to um, prove that. We use a very high in our column level. And again, we puncture, uh, puncture the leaves, you know, two wounds versus eight wounds at high level, it makes no difference in terms of the level of stem damage. So um, that was a little bit discouraging, but there was also a silver lining of, uh, of that study because uh, during the process we develop a, a methodology that uh, can quantify the amount of uh, the seed contamination in relation to the disease severity um, in the harvest of the seed. Uh, in this case, uh, the lower disease severity, and mostly uh, in those uh, uh, resistant uh, uh, plots, uh, those uh, darker uh, bars, and it seemed to uh, correlate with the reduced amount of uh, seed har the contamination uh, by the pathogen inoculum on the harvest of seed which may um, still, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, support the, the, the recommendation of a continued effort to reduce the disease levels for our export, right? The, um, in looking at the, uh, the uh, infection window, um, the early results showed us that the uh, um, application of, uh, of a fungicide need to be early uh, for it to be effective on a susceptible variety only. But we don't know how early uh, it should be. But at the same time, it, it didn't really uh, benefit the yield of uh, any of the resistant variety we've tested. 
So in this study, we wanted to determine um, you know, how early, uh, how important the, the early uh, uh, the infection is uh, in terms of a position of the leaf. So we uh, looked at the infection of, uh, of uh, cotyledon to six of the leaves in the greenhouse. And sure enough, the cotyledon infection is by far the most important uh, uh, one in terms of uh, causing disease uh, incidence and the severity. This is on the susceptible the variety West Star. Okay, so cotyledon infection is the most important one, but when we bring the, the resistance into the equation, use uh, several of them, but in this case, the only quantitative resistance uh, uh, is uh, is involved. We use the, the inoculum to uh, invade the any resistant genes in this uh, in those are R varieties. So it, it shows that the uh, on West Star, uh, pretty similar results as before, but it was a little bit surprising with the quantitative resistance. Uh, we did not get any infection even through the PDO inoculation. So that means you know the even quantitative resistance can effectively discourage the infection from the uh, the cotyledon. We take the the, uh, the test out to the field, pretty much a similar trend and uh, in terms of uh, the uh, susceptible and the resistant varieties. It also showed the importance of uh, cotyledon infection. In this case, they seem to be elevated uh, infection through other leaf inoculation, mainly because we think we did not uh, remove uh, cotyledons uh, from other inoculation in the field. Some natural inoculum may have affected the uh, the results a little bit. Well, because we know we know the cotyledon infection is uh, is the key or is important, that may provide us uh, with opportunity to look at uh, some seed treatments. Right. The uh, uh, this uh, slide just shows the you know, we we evaluated a large number of uh, candidates. Uh, coming down the industrial R&D pipelines and, uh, and including our industry standard of current seed treatment. And uh, that did not work. And uh, at the same time, one of the, uh, uh, the candidates in the uh, SDHI category, this new uh, systemic uh, fungicide that seems to be fairly effective against uh, cotyledon infection. The field results uh, pretty much give the similar kind of uh, uh, the results, uh, except um, this this is a registered rate uh, after uh, uh, our early results. The company seemed to be interested in it, and uh, uh, it, it, it seemed to control the cotyledon infection fairly effectively in terms of uh, the uh, um, black like the severity but it didn't work that well in the general field trials uh, where there is no specific inoculation relying more on the field, field inoculum, which may have a larger window of, uh, of the infection there. So we uh, try to um, justify increase the rate a little bit uh, to, uh, in this case, uh, to uh, 300 uh, uh, gram of, uh, of, of a treatment. That certainly show quite uh, uh, better uh, results uh, on the higher uh, the higher leaves, and, and uh, uh, the disease in the stem is a little bit of variable. We're still continuing, and uh, but the the efficacy on the different leaves uh, represented by different color seems to be quite uh, quite uh, clear by just uh, you know, increasing the seed treatment rates a little bit, and we can we can extend the efficacy into the higher uh, leaves. The um, last study we did was uh, the, uh, uh, to develop a new method of a screening for um, QR, quantitative resistance, which is normally a fairly uh, difficult process relying a lot on the field uh, study and, and the results can be variable. So we, uh, we uh, Look at the a process in a different study, uh, and by measuring the gross uh, kinetics of the pathogen in canola tissue, and then related that to 
the quantitative resistance that, that seem to have some connection uh, by just looking at the three of the quantitative resistance varieties we, we tested. And we thought in this study we expanded it to a larger number of, uh, of the candidates by working with the different seed companies to bring in a, um, uh, the varieties or lines that they have tested over multi-year uh, trials and in the category of uh, R, M, R, and S. And uh, we used those uh, uh, materials and the, the data and, uh, um, and compare with our measurement of uh, growth kinetics, uh, which is basically the amount of uh, pathogen DNA in the tissue. And by inoculating um, the, uh, the PDU of, uh, of a cotyledon in the greenhouse, it seemed to uh, to match uh, in most cases the uh, uh, the field data from the seed companies on those uh, uh, on those lines of varieties, and and that shows the the correlation of the two sets of uh, data, and we also test the uh, um, the inoculation through the cotyledon um, itself, and also well correlated, and uh, but the PDU inoculation is a lot easier. And to take this a bit further into uh, the field trials uh, using selected a number of uh, candidates and, and representing R, M, R, and S. And the, the results uh, seem to be very correlated in terms of uh, the field uh, resistance performance versus the amount of uh, the pathogen growth of kinetics uh, and what can we measured in, in the plant stem tissue. So this shows that that uh, uh, the method can be um, probably used to either screen or quantifying the QR in our varieties or breeding lines as a as a screening tool or quantification tool. Okay, a lot of people uh, were involved in this study, but uh, uh, um, I can't read all the name of it, but. Uh, also, uh, the funding agency support uh, uh, is important. Uh, and we'll uh, probably have a time for uh, Q&A uh, uh, when afterwards. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Gary. And our, our last speaker for today is um, Delantha Fernando. So he'll be talking about microbial lifestyles of black leg and verticillium stripe and their impact across the prairies. Good afternoon, everyone. So as the last speaker, uh, happy to give this talk. Um, as the title shows, uh, you see that I'm going to be talking about the microbial lifestyles of two pathogens. And very soon you will see that they are very different. And these are two different large programs, five years each. So actually I'm trying to condense everything into 15 minutes of 10 years work. So um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. So again, Doug, at any time that you want me to stop, because I know that people have flights to catch, just stop me. The slides are available for everyone to watch uh, from next week when, once the recording is done. So uh, the presentation will cover the two major uh, programs that were run um, under the canola cluster. And the one was the improving black leg resistance durability with our gene rotations. And that is uh, led by me uh, with Dr. Gary Peng and Ralph Lang being the collaborators, and the other, the verticillium disease etiology and nursery, again led by me with Dr. Mario Tenuta at the University of Manitoba. So right off the bat, I would like to ta thank everyone, the sponsors, the collaborators, the students, everyone, because I may not get to this slide later on. Now, the, I was also told that there would be more interest in the verticillium because it's a new disease. So I thought I will first address that. And if I have time, I will get to the black leg. Um, so verticillium disease, uh, as you can see uh, from the, the inoculum, 
that that is the microsclerotia that's very uh, much going to be in the soil for long periods of time, much different from black leg. So that's again a lifestyle. So uh, if you want to know a lot about the, uh, the disease, the questions that were asked and how it was answered, most of the research that I, was I have done was made into a podcast by Jay Vetter of the Canola Council of Canada, wonderful host, so you will see that the questions are right and hopefully the answers are right as well. So um, verticillium disease is a new disease. It was first identified in Manitoba for the first time in North, North America uh, in 2014 in, um, in, um, in Winnipeg, very close to Winnipeg, uh, in Glen Lee. And um, since then, the CFIA has done a number of tests, and they have found that the pathogen is available in, uh, is, is there in many different provinces, even in areas that canola may not be that predominantly grown. So this is an important factor that you need to keep in mind. Now, looking at the inoculum that is produced, you will see that the inoculum, uh, that is the microsclerotia, is formed right into the stem because it, uh, it's a root pathogen, and you can see that it is uh, uh, invading the whole stem system. Now, I will not go through this, but I just wanted to let you know that the pathogen can infect the whole plant. It can have chlorosis on the leaves, necrosis, and stems are the most predominant one that we would see in the latter part of the season. And that's the one that would have the stunting, the discoloration, and the blackening of the micro microsclerotia that is there. So here's a snapshot of the stem senescing. Uh, on one side, you will see more of the greenish color and the other brownish. Now, this can be mistaken with the fusarium wilt uh, also in canola, which is not that uh, uh, predominant in our period of, in, in this part of the Canada, but uh, at a particular time, it was very important. Here's a, a photo that uh, Justin took uh, in 2016, uh, Justin or uh, Vikram, I forget, um, in, um, uh, of verticillium uh, in different stages uh, in St. Rose, close to Dorf in Manitoba. So it's almost everywhere in Manitoba right now. I told you that my, there's very big differences between the two microbes, the black leg and the verticillium. Here's in one slide just a few things that I can capture to show you how different these two pathogens are. One is a stubble-borne pathogen, one is a soil-borne pathogen. You might ask me later, what's the difference? I will be happy to answer. Infection is at wet and warm temperatures, black leg. It is uh, dry and hot temperatures for verticillium. Uh, the, there's a sexual stage in black leg. There's no sexual stage in verticillium. Uh, the uh, asexual spores are there in both, but the asexual spores in the pathogen of verticillium is not that important as you would see in black leg. There's a high mutation rate in black leg. There's no particular mutation, a sexual mutation in the other. I'm moving far, uh, forward because of the time. Now, there's very big differences when you look at the pictures. Now, the, I... I uh, I'm told that farmers still get confused whether it's black leg or verticillium. And I can understand why that is, because they are both blackened areas. But there is a difference in the way that the uh, periphery of the blackening uh, is with black leg, and the verticillium is quite spread out throughout. And the inoculum, the, the pseudothesia and the microsclerotia are very different as well. Now, again, here's another picture just to uh, showcase the difference between a uh, black leg and verticillium and uh, the uh, clean stems. As I was told, there are many farmers or several farmers here, so you can ask questions if you have. Uh, I will be happy to answer. Now, the pathogen has a, um, different lineages, and the D1 a1D1 is the most, pop, most predominant in Canada at the moment. There's also A1D2 and a, uh, A1D3, and also verticillium dahlia. So the initial studies that we did in uh, our lab, we were able to find that the pathogen was quick 
uh, to uh, stunt the plants. Uh, you, you can see how uh, the plants are stunted uh, uh, compared to a clean plant, and that's a very good indication of the pathogen. Now, the first indications of the pathogen, uh, when Dr. Joe, uh, who did the initial work, was able to show that what we had in Manitoba belonged to the A1, D1 lineage and not the others. Now, the A1, D1 can be separated very clearly with this kind of marker system from the A1, D2 and A1, D3. Now, after Dr. Joe did the initial work, there were others who uh, came on board and did different uh, areas of this research. So th their research is being um, shown to you with uh, different questions asked. Now, for example, there was no characterized host resistance in canola varieties for Longisporum. Uh, there was no information on the variation of the pathogen, whether it is just A1, D1, or whether we had others. There was no information on the distribution pattern of the pathogen. All these are known for black leg, but not for verticillium. There was no knowledge on uh, the survivability of the pathogen in the soil not enough information on the genome and geno uh, genes, and no knowledge on the stage of canola uh, that uh, is the most susceptible. So these were the questions that we asked in our uh, verticillium work. So there were studies as burial studies to see how long they can um, last, uh, dispersal studies to look at how, uh, uh, how wide they can um, go from uh, inoculum source, uh, the germplasm study to uh, look at the availability of resistance in our germplasm in Canada and also looking at isolation and seeing whether the pathogen can survive for longer periods of time. So here's a bur burial study. I'm not going to pay uh, a lot of attention to this because uh, th you can see that very soon there will be a uh, uh, journal article coming out of this work that we have been doing to look at uh, how uh, deep the pathogen can uh, sustain itself and still survive and not get uh, disintegrated. The dispersal study was an interesting study. We did this uh, in, um, uh, Kelburn, in the Kelburn farm. We had to select a place that the pathogen was not there because initially you have to find a source where there was no inoculum to start and go through and see where the pathogen was moving. And to make a long story short, we were able to find hotspots. You can see the hotspots, and this was not a, a distribution like a gradient. Now, if it was an airborne pathogen, the pathogen has a gradient because the airborne uh, pathogen's inoculum is taken with the wind, and uh, that was not evident in this uh, work with the verticillium. There were, uh, in different areas, there was the pathogen's presence after the inoculum, uh, initial inoculum was placed. Now, when we started the screening of uh, canola lines, the first year we started with uh, looking at germplasm in two different sites that had natural inoculum. One was in Portage, one was in Kelburn. And these were ideal sites because we were not inoculating anything. The inoculum was there. All that we had to do was to put the germplasm and study. And the first year we could not uh, uh, get the MTS ready in time for the season, so we went with some of the germplasm we had, with, that was the Chinese lines, we had about 156 lines uh, to get the, uh, to set up the screening methods and to see whether we would be able to screen larger amounts of uh, in, uh, varieties and germplasm from uh, seed companies. So we set up this and uh, you can see in the susceptible variety there is lodging, complete lodging very quickly and that shows the wilting and striping of the pathogen uh, uh, by verticillium longisporum. Now by 2020, we were able to get the material uh, from uh, seed companies in 2021 and 2022, and we have uh, very good uh, information to share with you that there are, so these are, you are, you are, you are seeing Vesta at a four. The score levels that we used was zero to four, and uh, Vesta was at a four, and uh, in the other location it was at 3.8. So we were very uh, 
confident of the results if we were seeing some resistance. And uh, this is, oh, sorry, I, I have put the slide in the wrong place. This should be after this, where we had different companies participating. I have named them as source A, B, C, D, E, and they all have, the good news is they all have resistance. And here, this particular slide shows the resistance at the, the particular uh, place that we looked. Vesta had a 3.8, and the germplasm that we had from source A, let's say company A, had three uh, types of uh, germplasm. Now, they might be Commercial varieties, I'm not, uh, I don't know, the company knows. Uh, they are having resistance. So very soon, if these are commercially uh, available varieties, the companies might be in a position to name them that they are verticillium resistant. So this is the very good news that I am bringing to you today. Now, the other part of the project was to look at whether there are different growth stages of the plant that was making the plant being more susceptible. And yes, it has. It, if the inoculum is made at uh, around four weeks, that's one month, the plants are more diseased. So there seems to be a tendency to be uh, less disease occurring if the inoculum is, inoculations are done at an early stage compared to second week and then compared to the third week. And these are the results that we saw in the height of the plant sets as well. And uh, so from that, we can conclude that these results indicated that the longisporum caused higher damage at the later de development stages of canola. So the question that you can ask on that is whether that is one of the reasons that we see a later disease and uh, at the maturity stage as well. So something for you to think about. So I'm going to skip this because of the uh, time that I'm now up against and show you that Saskatchewan has a very different profile. Saskatchewan, we don't have as much isolates as we have from Manitoba. However, we have A1, D1, A1, D2, and A1, D3, all three lineages present in a small amount of isolates that we had from Saskatchewan. So, Again, a very interesting finding if to lead for other questions in the future. Now, in the Manitoba isolates, you see a very uniform A1D1 uh, throughout. So we haven't found anything other than A1D1 in Manitoba. And in Ontario, we had, didn't have a lot of samples, but the samples showed that it is not verticillium longisporum, but it is verticillium dalii, also causing the same disease in canola. So that's another thing to consider, think about it. So uh, in summary, I have given you the, the very de details that I showed you, so I'm not going to sp spend time on that. Um, I'm just going to tell you that we have done some genome analysis on verticillium longisporum, and uh, the work is still ongoing, but again, we are getting some wonderful results that I will be very happy to share at a different uh, conference. And I think my time is up, so as I predicted, unfortunately, I won't be able to get into the black leg part of it, but uh, you'll be um, able to look at the results. I have put everything uh, with notes as well in the presentation on the black leg side of the project that we had done. Thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot, Delantha. And just to remind everyone, again, that um, the rest of Delantha's slides will be available on the website. Uh, so I'd like to welcome back all of this afternoon's speakers up to the stage for a Q&A session. Okay, so do we have any questions? We, we don't have any uh, uh, virtual questions uh, today, so it's just for it in the audience. So, yeah. uh, first question is from Keith Fournier. Yeah, the question is on the hairy canola. The, some of the worst 
uh, flea beetle damage I've had in canola is uh, after about three or four really windy days, and the flea beetles go down and do some stem feeding. One bite and the, and the plant is gone. So the, if we get the hairy canola, is that going to go down onto the stem and protect it? Um, you know, I, is that working? Oh, sorry. You have to speak loudly into this thing and then it activates. Uh, no, that's a very good question. Um, the, uh, the brassica napis lines that we have now have um, uh, hairs on the leaves and they have hairs on the petioles, but not on the stems. And we have done some studies to show that they'll leave the leaves and they'll move on to the stem and clip them. The material coming out of the brassica velosa, which was the very, very hairy um, uh, brassica material, those have hairs everywhere on all parts of the plant. So we're really thrilled with that. Um, one of the things I think will be very interesting is when we cross the, uh, the Brassica Rapa with the um, this hairy uh, Velosa derivative to resynthesize Napus. Um, you know, the, the Napus has the, the cactus-like uh, trichomes, the Velosa has the velvet-like trichomes. Um, to see what happens in that context is going to be really interesting. It'd be wonderful if we could get a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Brassica Napus you know, full of these cactus-like trichomes on all parts of the plant, but it's, it's genetically possible, so. All right, uh, do we have another question? Hi, I have a question. Uh, a verticillium and, and black-like question, so maybe Delantha, you might be the best one to answer this. Like, we know from previous surveys that the verticillium pathogen and black leg pathogen are really closely associated in, in most plants. Like 95% of the time, they're usually found in conjunction with each other. What are your thoughts around what is that relationship between these two pathogens? Is, is there one pathogen that is the, the dominant one that initiates the infection that causes the other one to become more severe? Um, do we have a, a good understanding of, of, of how these, these two uh, work together? Thank you. Just, just talk into it, it should okay. go. Thank you, Clint, for that question. Um, so uh, we have um, anecdotal evidence that there is uh, interaction or there seems to be an interaction between black leg and uh, verticillium. So we started uh, looking at this, uh, uh, starting with certain genes, RLM2 and RLM4, um, and um, I have results that I can share with you. It's very interesting. Now, I, we have done only one way. That is, first to have the black leg infecting the canola and then looking at verticillium infection. So I, we, we are going to do it in reverse as well to see whether there's, to answer your question, whether there's a uh, way that the black leg gets in if uh, verticillium has infected. So uh, looking at the <clears throat> initial results that um, we just got, uh, I, I didn't put that slide because it's very new. Uh, RLM2, when interacting with the avirulent gene, uh, the verticillium uh, score out of four is two. Uh, when RLM2 uh, is interacting with the virulent isolate the, of the black leg pathogen, that means the plant is now being stressed with the black leg, the uh, verticillium reaction is 2.8. So there's an increase in the disease. So the same trend was seen with RLM4. When AVRLM4 was interacting, that's the resistant interaction, 2.6. And when the virulent isolate was interacting with RLM4, the verticillium uh, 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 score was 3.2. That's getting closer to the 3.8 that we see with Vesta. So there seems to be, now we, want, we need to uh, test it further. We want to look at whether there's a particular gene interaction, like certain R genes are different from the other as well. Good question. Um, I have a question, or actually I actually have two. Uh, first one's for Hector, and that would be how what or uh, how do the trap crop system work for uh, the cabbage seed pod weevil management in canola? You mentioned like early flowering canola. How much earlier would it be compared to the um, the main part of the field? Just in general, how would that work? And then the second question for Susie: 
on, um, you had mentioned that the, the boxes for the uh, sclerotinia detection needed, um, they were connected into the cell phone network. Um, any kind of considerations around areas that might not be within cell reception, just because that's an issue sometimes that we, we run into in, uh, in certain fields, so. We should answer first. Yeah, go ahead, Hector. Hector. Okay, thank you for asking the question about trap crops. Uh, so the the way the trap crop works is as long as you have about a five to seven day difference in in stages. So if you have the border, and the border can be just one seeding path, so it doesn't have to be very wide, uh, something like 20 meters, so about uh, 60 feet, that probably will be enough. And you plant it along the entire perimeter and it's, it works better if you have larger fields. If you have smaller fields, then there's a chance that the weevil can actually uh, overwhelm the field and spill into the middle. But if you, if you have larger fields, so there's say, you know, the usual field is uh, three, 400 acres, that should be, should be good enough. And if you have a seven day difference, the longer, the more time there is between the trap crop and the main crop, uh, then it, it's better, but it, it can work even if you have a five to seven day difference. And that that time we did it with Polish canola, which of course is not an option now, but I think there are now cultivars that are fairly flowering and you can probably plant at the same time the, the trap crop border with an early flowering cultivar and then plant the middle with a, a later flowering cultivar and use a shutter resistant uh, cultivar. So you don't have to worry about uh, when you harvest it as much. Okay, my turn, I guess. Uh, so for now, uh, this summer, because uh, we were in a rush, we are making it an email format. So you receive emails, but uh, in the near future, we're going to have app. As long as your cell phone works, like you have a cell phone tower nearby, you should be able to receive the message. But if you even can't get uh, uh, your cell phone work, then no, then uh, at this point, no. Question for Dwayne. One of your slides had a little asterisk that said red anthocyanins protected the cotyledons. Was there a story there that you didn't have time for? I, well, I didn't have time for a lot. Um, I, I gave too long a talk and I was very rushed, so I apologize for that. Uh, actually, that asterisk is important because in the original hairy canola that, uh, that Margie Gruber and Julie Soroka made, okay, uh, the, the leaves were very resistant to tolerant to flea beetle um, uh, feeding. The cotyledons, though, don't have hairs, but when we assayed them, they were also resistant or tolerant to flea beetle feeding. And we did a bit of chemistry and were able to correlate that with the levels of a red pigment called anthocyanin. And you probably don't remember, but the slide before that, I indicated that the two genes that the uh, that were manipulated, the GL3 and the TTG1, they control a bunch of different pathways, one of which leads to hair formation, another one which leads to secondary pigments such as anthocyanins. So those two genes were actually doing two very beneficial things. One, it was making uh, hairs on the leaves, and secondly, it was um, incorporating anthocyanins into the cotyledons, which also drove resistance. Now, we haven't looked yet on whether or not the material that we have coming out of our mapping populations has um, any, any elevated um, secondary metabolites like anthocyanins, but uh, we're certainly going to look at that. So a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. I missed so much stuff, so. All right, so I think the audience has really thinned out. So I'll open it up for one final question, if there are any. Maybe two questions, three. <laughs> More? Come on. Um, thank you all so much for the presentations today. It was great. This is an area I still love and hang out in. Um, but I do have a question for Delantha on verticillium stripe. 
Um, you know, we're coming on 10 years of working with this disease now. Um, and with your project in particular, we've been really waiting for uh, results to come out of it and how growers can actually manage this disease that is widespread across Manitoba and showing up more and more in Saskatchewan. Um, so based on your work, what would you recommend growers to do right now? Thank you for that question. I think it's a very important question, uh, uh, Justin. Um, the first thing that I will say is the good news that I just shared. There seems to be material that is in, uh, either in the pipeline of uh, all companies that participated. So there were five companies that participated with us. Uh, all have good uh, resistance, uh, at least two to three germplasm that they uh, seed that they shared with us. Uh, not every, everything that they shared. So each company, I should have mentioned, uh, shared 10 to uh, 20 uh, different lines or uh, germ elite germplasm. So out of that, uh, only two to three were resistant. So which means there is some uh, difference uh, in the resistance uh, to verticillium in their uh, germplasm. Now, I don't, what I don't know is whether the ones that came as resistant are the ones that are very close to either being developed as a variety. If that's the case, that's great news. And most likely, the companies might start to label them as verticillium resistant and go from there. They might have done their own indoor uh, studies as well. So this would be a confirmation of their work, uh, of their uh, findings. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, um, because the verticillium has the potential, so, uh, one of the things that I couldn't finish is to show the burial study, it seems like the pathogen can survive. So the pathogen, because it's uh, producing microsclerosia, very different microbial lifestyle from the black leg. So because of that, when, if the pathogen is surviving, then the options are limited for us on an agronomic sense. We cannot go with crop rotations the way we go with black leg. So for now, I would say do the things that you would do for club root because uh, they, they are both soil-borne pathogens, verticillium and club root. They both get d disseminated uh, with soil particles and uh, moves around uh, with uh, machinery. So all that you think about club root management, you can actually apply for verticillium for now until the companies come up and say, oh, we have resistance to verticillium. But the good news is that we do in Canada have resistance to verticillium, but I don't know is at what stage the germplasm is. So there's no fungicide available, right? So there, there are limitations into the management strategy. All right, Michael, did you have a question? Okay. All right. I'd, uh, is Clint still in the room? Yep. Yeah. Did you want to do some wrap-up comments and sure. ask a question at the same time? Okay, uh, just one more quick question then. I'm going to put uh, Gary and Hossein on the spot. So quantitative resistance screening, uh, when will we, or for, for Black Lake, when do you think that we'll be able to have that in hands for breeders to, or pathologists to use? Um, for uh, uh, quantitative resistance, uh, I mean, the issue would be that we have at least, uh, in, in the case of Castle, that we have done a, and at, there are at least three, four uh, genes that are common, and definitely it would be a challenge to uh, get those genes uh, into uh, into uh, commercial cultivars. Uh, one of the genes on A8 shows the most, basically, significant resistance. So I think the case would be that we, the ideal would be that we have one or two major genes, uh, quantitative resistance genes, with some uh, with uh, major gene resistance, so definitely that's doable. Uh, so it's probably would be, uh, would be like the A8 one that we have marker for it could be easily integrated, and that's that's uh, one with the major effect. So not April. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, is it better? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, a really good question. Then, uh, um, from 
two perspectives, uh, you know, from the seed companies that we've been talking to. Uh, it can be a good uh, screening um, tool, at least to weed out the, the ones uh, in your breeding uh, materials uh, without uh, quantitative without uh, quantitative resistance quite, quite quickly. quickly. And I, and I believe everybody wanted to validate the, uh, the, results the results in the field. In the field. But, so far, but so far, we're very confident to screen, screen out the, the, the bad ones, ones okay. and, uh, fairly quickly. quickly. And, from and from the, the industry, industry well, well, in general, in general and, uh, and uh, we if we wanted to really label uh, 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 the level of a quantitative resistance, we probably need to have a bit of a buy-in from the seed industry first, and they. Believe, believe the uh, the, uh, the uh, quantification, quantification uh, uh, tool is uh, is, uh, is uh, reasonable, accurate, accurate and, uh, and uh, when they start using, using that as a screening tool, and, probably, and probably you know, uh, uh, in general, uh, well, for, for recommendation purpose, we can start uh, looking at the quanti quantification, quantification labeling of uh, of a uh, uh, QR, uh, QR on our uh, on the varieties. So, so it's uh, it's on my next next to do list to. Contact, contact the seed companies, companies that get the, the, the protocol the going, and it will screen uh, a few hundred uh, candidates uh, in the next few months. So we can do that by April. Great. <laughs> That's not That's what I'm doing. saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but oh. it's on our next to-do list. It's uh, it's true. Okay. Well, let's uh, please give a warm uh, hand of appreciation to all of our uh, speakers here. Thank you very much. We do have some mugs here for you folks so that you can grab on, on, on your way out, or Taryn can hand them out. Uh, Curtis Rample has uh, uh, left the building, so that uh, unfortunately for you guys, uh, that, remi that means that I have to read his writing uh, for the uh, closing remarks here. But um, I'll fumble my way through this. Um, really, first of all, I, I want to thank all the speakers that, that we had here this afternoon and this morning, uh, you all did a, a fantastic job at sharing some really important research for, for us, uh, for the industry, and for the, uh, the entire ag sector. Your work is, is, is essential for our success. But um, this, this wraps the, well, we're pretty close to wrapping the, the, the CAP cluster right now. And uh, I really should be recognizing the, the funders that have provided, uh, um, provided this opportunity for this great research to, to, uh, to occur, namely the Growers uh, Ag Canada uh, and the Canola Council's uh, funders as well. Uh, we're currently putting together a, uh, a proposal for the, for the next round of, of cluster funding, the, uh, the SCAP or the uh, Sustainable Ag Partnership. And our approach is going to be fairly similar to, to how we put together the, the CAP application. Uh, we, we see it as bringing together growers in the value chain's research priorities to advance our sector and uh, marry that up with the Government of Canada's uh, priorities for uh, growth and sustainability. So, but in conclusion, like innovation, it, innovation has built our, our industry. And innovation from this private and, and public partnership that, that, we've just, uh, that we've just witnessed here, it will anchor our sector's continued success and growth and resiliency in years to come. So we really look forward to continuing this research par uh, partnership that we have with you and with the growers and, and every uh, component of the, of the research industry, like the universities at Canada and other research groups. So thank you all for that. And, and thank you all for, for being really great participants here over today and, and if you were here for the, the rest of, of Canola Week, I thank you for, for making this a full, uh, full week. And um, I'm going to conclude with just a couple of housekeeping items. Your lanyards, please return them at the, uh, at the front desk. Um, we do have surveys. Do, do we have a survey actually for the CAP day as well? That's Okay, so that will be coming to you uh, next week. So please complete that. If you were part of Canola Week, uh, please go back onto that app and, and complete the surveys for, for each individual day. This will really help us shape um, Canola Week 2023 into something even better. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, this was recorded. Uh, we should have the recordings available for you to, to view, to really dig deep into Delantha's slides that, that we missed. Uh, that should be available sometime uh, next week. So really wish everybody happy holidays and some safe travels and have a very good day. We are done. <laughs>